with us this evening on our this uh, well done pg update i extend you a warm welcome on my own personal behalf and on behalf of uh, isa kerala state chapter welcome you sir to this meeting thank you sir the second part of today's discussion is the is the drugs in anesthesia we have our own eminent and active members dr sajish pa who is the senior consultant at anandapuri hospital tiruvannadapuram and uh, dr paula rafael who is uh, professor and head of department of anesthesia at amara institute of medical sciences thrissur both are very active members and paul is our uh, editor of our kerala state journal i welcome dr sajish pj and dr paulo rafael to this meeting thank, thank you sir we have dr charida uddas ullas and dr minu ros uh, was the residents from amala institute of medical sciences uh, to present on this uh, drug synthesis topic i welcome dr charida uddas and dr minu ros <coughs> to this meeting i welcome all our uh, members all our officials uh, and there are uh, many senior members and many national isa officials who are with us uh, i welcome you all to this meeting i welcome all the delegates and all the members of uh, isa family to this meeting today dr rajesh and dr vijesh uh, has taken leave due to some unavoidable reasons uh, and dr vidil will be coordinating uh, today's academic activities i request uh, dr giri for the opening remarks Dr. Giri, please. Good evening, uh, President uh, Dr. Nazar, Secretary Minnil, uh, Faculty, and uh, Past Editor uh, Dr. Devetia, sir. Uh, other two faculties, uh, uh, Dr. Paul and uh, Sanish, uh, uh, I see Ignorance, I see Dr. Chakrarao there, IRC Chairman, and uh, I see Anand Bangera and many others. Uh, good evening. you all and welcome to this uh, pg webinar uh, of this week it is our endeavor to give the best possible to the pgs uh, by getting the best faculties from all over india so that the pgs will get the benefit of uh, uh, teaching by the best faculty so far uh, it was not uh, there at all that uh, we were uh, getting the teaching only in our institute or anybody in their own institute with this uh, the pg get exposure to the best faculties from india and we are continuing this and it is for the pgs to take this and uh, make use of it with this uh, 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 we, we don't have our uh, scientific uh, uh, committee advisors or coordinators dr um, vijesh and rajesh so we will straight away go to the first topic i don't think uh, dr divetia requires any introduction to uh, any of the pg most uh, sort of the speaker and uh, uh, binil anything you have to say otherwise you straight away request uh, dr divetia for his uh, lecture please binil binil let uh, have a short introduction of the today speaker let binil over to binil for the academic activities and uh, introduce the speaker and proceed the academics binil please so uh, thank you very much and uh, warm uh, greetings from isa kerala state chapter and uh, wishes of uh, easter uh, to all the isa members and uh, today's the first topic will be the modes of ventilation i hope i am audible yes all you must less that's the only thing yeah. otherwise uh the today's first topic will be the modes of ventilation and it will be it will be the so our debater sir will be presenting it in two or three parts so today is the first part of modes of ventilation uh, debater sir does not require any introduction he is the professor and head of the department of anesthesia critical care in tata memorial hospital mumbai he he, uh, he is the past editor in chief of indian journal of anesthesia past president of all india difficult airway association and he is the past president of indian society of critical care medicine his area of interest include hemodynamic monitoring sepsis ventilation end of life care and airway management he got over 100 publications in national and international prestigious journals he is a member of editor board uh, journal of anesthesiology and clinical pharmacology indian journal of critical care medicine He is a referee for um, uh, Journal of Postgraduate Medicine, National Medical Journal of India, 
Indian Journal of Surgery and Indian Journal of Cancer. He got uh, many presentations in uh, international and national uh, state and uh, state conferences. Uh, over to you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, it is my great pleasure to speak here at the ISA Kerala PG Assembly, which is very, very popular. I thank Dr. Nazar, uh, Dr. Venkat Giri for inviting me, uh, Dr. Binil. Uh, so I'm happy to speak on modes of uh, ventilation. Okay. Now, just give me a minute to... Yes, slide share is on. Sir. Okay. It's perfect, visible. Yeah. So <clears throat> we'll be speaking on uh, fundamentals of mechanical ventilation and we'll start with some of the basic modes of ventilation. Right? Now, when we <clears throat> ventilate patients, I mean, our goals, we have certain goals in mind. We want to ensure that there's adequate oxygenation of the patient. We want to make sure that there's acceptable carbon dioxide uh, elimination. So the ventilation is going well. We want to reduce work of breathing. And one of the most important things that we've learned in the last 20 years is we need to make sure that there is no ventilator induced lung injury. So one of the most important goals of ventilation, no matter in what condition you, or what condition you're ventilating the patient, you need to prevent ventilator induced lung injury, right? Uh, okay, now, you know, for all the complexity that, that appears when you look at a ventilator, it appears such a very complex, sophisticated uh, machine, you know, all these numbers flashing, the graphs flowing in and out and, you know, the alarms going and, you know, it looks very intimidating. It looks very dramatic. But at the end of the day, the ventilator is a very, very simple instrument. Conceptually, a ventilator does only one thing. It pushes air into the patient in inspiration. And it allows the patient to breathe out. So it only controls inspiration. Expiration or exhalation is a completely passive process. And the ventilator allows that. And so essentially what the ventilator is doing, it's allowing gas to flow in and out of the patient. And it controls the flow of gas into the patient by means of uh, valves. So there's something which is pushing gas into a patient and there is the valves which control the flow of gas in and out of the patient. So let's say there is an inspiratory valve and there is a expiratory valve. So when the inspiratory valve opens, gas flows into the patient, right? The expiratory valve is of course closed at that point in time. Now, if after the inspiratory valve opens and gas starts going into the patient, if you close the inspiratory valve, then now you have both the inspiratory as well as the expiratory valves closed after the inspiratory valve has opened. And this phase is called the period of the inspiratory pause or the inspiratory hold. Then the expiratory valve opens, the inspiratory valve is closed, the expiratory valve opens and gas goes out of the patient, right? Uh, and that this is the phase of exhalation. And just like you can have give an inspiratory hold, you can close the expiratory valve in expiration. And that is the period of the expiratory pause. So if you look at it like this, so this is the patient's trachea. This is a trachea over here. This is the, right? So the gas is coming in and going in this direction. Right? So this is the inspiratory, valve, inspiratory limb. This is the expiratory limb. This bar here is the inspiratory valve. This is the expiratory valve. So when the inspiratory valve opens, gas flows into the patient. And this is the phase of inspiration, right? So now gas goes into the patient and inspiration goes on over here like this. Then you can close the inspiratory valve in inspiration. So now you can see that the after inspiration has occurred, gas has gone into the lungs. The lungs have expanded. Now you've closed the inspiratory valve in inspiration. And once you close the inspiratory valve in inspiration, there is no flow of gas into the patient, right? And that's why it's called the inspiratory hold or the inspiratory pause. So you see that the inspiratory flow comes down to zero, right? So here the flow rate, so because here I've plotted flow rate versus time, so the flow rate has now come down to zero and this is the inspiratory pause. And then the expiratory valve opens and this is the beginning of expiration, right? So this, so these are the sort of phases of inspiration and expiration that we 
are going to talk about. So just keep these things in mind when we talk of the different things that we do. Okay. It's the expiratory valve open and that's expiration. Now we said that there is something pushing air into the patient and that is what is very important as far as the ventilator is concerned. That is what is, how is it controlling the flow of gas? Or what is the, it's controlling when gas goes into the patient? Now, you know, the ventilator, like I said, you know, we are all doctors and, you know, we are all uh, look treating patients and we are looking at lungs and that sort of thing. But the ventilator is designed by engineers. And when engineers want to know something about, uh, about gas flow and so on, they essentially want to know what is the, uh, reduce it to some sort of mathematical term. And this is, the, this mathematical thing for the ventilator or ventilation is called the equation of motion of the respiratory system. And essentially what it says is that the pressure that is developed in the airway, the airway pressure is the baseline pressure plus the resistance of the respiratory system into the flow rate, which is being given by the ventilator plus the tidal volume upon the compliance of the respiratory system, right? Now, if the ventilator controls the airway pressure, so it maintains the airway pressure constant, then that is called a pressure controller. And when the airway pressure is held constant by the ventilator, so then the tidal volume that is developed varies depending on the resistance and the compliance of the respiratory system, right? So this is a pressure controlled ventilation. And in pressure controlled ventilation, what happens is that the airway pressure is held constant and the tidal volume delivered to the patient depends on the resistance and the compliance of the airway. So this is pressure controlled ventilation. On the other hand, if the patient, if the ventilator maintains a flow rate or the tidal volume constant, then we call it as volume controlled ventilation. And when the, so when this part, when this side of the equation, the right side of the equation is held, the flow rate or the volume is held constant, then the airway pressure developed varies with the resistance and compliance of the lungs and airways. So if a patient, so in, <clears throat> now, you know, I just have the one small clarification I want to make, you know, we say volume control and we are, but I'm also writing flow control. What the ventilator does, it actually keeps the flow, holds a flow rate constant and it varies the inspiratory time to give you different tidal volumes. So the tidal volume is a flow rate into the inspiratory time. And what most ventilators do is they hold a flow rate constant and they change the inspiratory time to give the desired tidal volume that you have set. So essentially they're controlling flow rate, but because it also sort of controls tidal volume, we commonly call it volume control ventilation. So the terms flow rate and tight volu flow, volume control and flow control, we are going to use interchangeably. But essentially when we are talking of volume control, it is the flow rate that is being held constant by the ventilator. Okay, now, so, Again, let me just go through the difference. So in, if you're giving pressure control, let's say I'm giving a pressure control ventilation and the ventilator is holding the pressure, say of 20 constant in the patient and say the tidal volume being delivered is 500 ml with that, with the baseline compliance and resistance of the respiratory system. If the patient gets bronchospasm, so the resistance increases, right? The resistance significantly increases and therefore the tidal volume delivered will go down. Right and or the or the compliance falls, then the tidal volume delivered will go down. The pressure remains the same, and the tidal volume will go down. On the other hand, in volume controlled ventilation, right, if the resistance increases, the patient develops bronchospasm. The tidal volume that I'm giving, say I've set a tidal volume of 400 ml, the tidal volume will always be delivered, but the airway pressure will shoot up. Right, so that's what happens with volume control. So these are the big differences between volume control ventilation and pressure control ventilation. In volume control, you set the tidal volume and that is held constant by the ventilator, right? Whereas in pressure control ventilation, the pressure, the peak inspiratory pressure is set by you and that is held constant by the ventilator. In tight, in, so in volume control ventilation, the tidal volume is constant, but the pressure developed is variable. The peak pressure is variable. In pressure control, the pressure set is, const, is set constant and the tidal volume uh, delivered varies depending on the resistance and compliance of the lungs and chest wall. And you know, so here, what I've done is I've plotted flow rate and airway pressure versus time. Okay. And this is volume control ventilation and this is pressure control ventilation. Okay. Now just follow me a little bit for, stay with me for just one and a half minutes. 
Now, see in volume control ventilation, what is happening is the inspiratory valve opens, flow goes in, and now throughout the inspiratory time, the flow rate is held constant. Once it reaches a certain flow rate, which you set, it will remain constant throughout the inspiratory time, and then it will change over to expiration, or the flow rate will come down to zero, right? So the flow rate is being held constant. And the pressure which is developing is varying. So pressure is not constant, right? So remember this, these waveforms. Now in pressure control ventilation, what the ventilator is doing, it's holding the pressure is being held constant throughout the inspiratory time. And the flow rate, the inspiratory flow, which you're seeing is what we are calling as a decelerating flow. So the flow rate rises to the peak and then it slows, it keeps slowing down. The flow rate keeps reducing throughout the inspiratory time. And this is called a decelerating flow. Now the decelerating flow or decelerating flow rate is the hallmark of any pressure limited or pressure controlled mode of ventilation. So please keep this in mind. A decelerating flow is a hallmark of pressure control ventilation. I'll just come to uh, in a minute as to why that is so. Okay. So please remember two very important differences. Again, I'm going to repeat and Dr. Binil has assured me that I have some time. So I'm going to take some time to emphasize this point of view, this point that in volume control ventilation, the tidal volume is held constant and the pressure that develops varies. And this flow rate, flow rate like you can see is being held constant. So this is what we call a square uh, square hat pattern or a square wave pattern, which you see in the inspiratory flow. In pressure control ventilation, the pressure is held constant, but the flow rate, the flow rate is a decelerating flow and the tidal volume delivered varies depending on the resistance and compliance of the respiratory system, right? So this is a decelerating flow. So now the other thing I want you to no notice is that the expiratory waveform in both volume control and pressure control ventilation is identical. And that is because any ventilator only controls the inspiratory phase, expiratory expiration or exhalation is a completely passive process. And therefore the expiratory flow waveform is identical whether you're giving volume control ventilation or pressure control ventilation. Are these differences sort of more or less clear? I mean, I know I can't interact with you, but if there's a big problem, you can put on your chat and maybe I can clarify again after some time. Okay. All right. So I think you can do a live chat. If you think it's okay, you can do a thumbs up or I don't know whatever, a smiley or something like that. Okay. So. So this is why I said you'll always get a decelerating flow during pressure control ventilation. Now, remember that the ventilator is holding the pressure constant. So here, let's say the ventilator is delivering pressure and holding the pressure constant at a 20 centimeters of water. It's delivering, and this is the lung, right? And initially the alveoli are completely collapsed. The lung is empty. So the pressure inside the alveoli is zero. Pressure inside the lung is zero. And therefore there is a gradient, a pressure gradient of 20 centimeters of water between the ventilator and the lung. And so initially, there's a very rapid flow of gas into the patient. Now, as the lung starts expanding with the gas flowing into the patient, you'll find that the let's say the alveoli have partially expanded. So now the gradient, and there is now a pressure of five centimeters in the lung. So the gradient is reduced, and therefore the flow rate will reduce. And so as the lung keeps getting more and more full, the gradient between the ventilator and the lung keeps reducing and the flow rate keeps slowing down. And that's why you will always you get a decelerating flow in pressure controlled ventilation. And when there is the lung is completely full, there's equilibration of pressure between the ventilator and the lung, then the flow rate will stop and the patient will. And so then it will be equilibrium and then it will be probably time for the lung to go into the ventilator go into exhalation. But essentially, this is why you always get a decelerating flow with pressure controlled ventilation. Okay, so please keep this in mind. Hallmark of pressure control ventilation is a decelerating inspiratory flow waveform. Okay, now I have highlighted some of the differences between volume control and uh, pressure control earlier, right? But there's one more big difference which we need to keep in mind. Okay, now in volume control ventilation, you know, we said that the flow rate is fixed. In other words, irrespective of the breathing pattern, the flow rate being delivered to the ventilation is not going to change. So if I have set, say, a flow rate of 40 centimeters of water, uh, I mean, of uh, 40 liters per minute, then no matter what is the type of breathing that the patient is doing, the patient will always get a flow rate of 40 liters per minute to the coming from the ventilator. So if my breathing is normal, as I, like this, okay, then that 40 liters may be okay. But suppose something happens and I get,
get a little anxious or i start developing pulmonary edema and my respiratory rate goes up my flow my flow rate my own flow rate the requirement for flow may be 60 70 or 80 liters per minute when i start getting breathless but the ventilator is going to give me only 40 liters per minute and therefore there will be asynchrony between me and the ventilator because the ventilator is giving a fixed flow rate and my flow rate requirement has changed so there is a greater scope of patient ventilator dyssynchrony if you are giving a fixed flow rate and if the doctor or the technician attending to me does not recognize that i need a higher flow rate and does not increase the flow rate there will be dyssynchrony between me and the ventilator right on the other hand with pressure controlled ventilation with any pressure limited mode of ventilation the inspiratory flow follows the patient's respiratory pattern and therefore the flow rate will increase of course the pressure generated will be the same the tidal volume may fall but the flow pattern will match the patient's respiratory inspiratory flow pattern and therefore there is less dyssynchrony in pressure control modes as compared to volume control modes provided you have not uh, right but of course the downside of all pressure control modes is that tidal volume varies with changes in lung characteristics okay so these are the two very important things and also there's pressure control and invariably compensates for leaks whereas with a volume preset ventilation if there is a leak you will get a reduction in tidal volume okay so <clears throat> now we mentioned you know that about the inspiratory valve opening closing and all and uh, the so the other big important uh, thing that you need to know is that the volume control mode despite its drawbacks of having a fixed inspiratory flow and some potential for ventilator dyssynchrony is a fantastic mode to understand respiratory mechanics okay so what happens in volume control ventilation like i said as the inspiratory valve opens gas flows in to the patient right now when the gas is flowing in it has to overcome the airway resistance and it has to overcome the stiffness of the lung in other words the peak inspiratory pressure which is generated when gas flows into the lungs depends on both the airway resistance as well as, as well as the compliance of the lung right that is required so that is so the peak inspiratory pressure depends on the airway resistance and the compliance of the lung now if i close the inspiratory valve in inspiration which is the inspiratory pause now there is zero flow and when there is zero flow there is no resistive element remaining so when there is no resistive element remaining right the pressure will come down now the pressure will never fall to zero why because now this lung has been distended when the gas flows into the patient so now what you are seeing is the pressure of the distended lung and that depends only on the compliance of the lung okay so the peak pressure and this pressure is called the plateau pressure right during the the pressure that you see during the inspiratory hold so the peak pressure we said depends on the airway resistance as well as the compliance the plateau pressure during the inspiratory pause only depends on the lung compliance and that is why it tells you what is the compliance of the lung without any effect of airway resistance so that's a very important information that we get also this represents the pressure of the distended lung right so if there is alveolar over distension if there is too much distension of the alveoli so maybe with a large tidal volume or excessive peep or air trapping or something like that then the plateau pressure will go up and we know today that one of the most important determinants of ventilator induced lung injury is over distended alveoli or what we call as volume trauma and therefore the plateau pressure is a good way of knowing whether or not the lung is over distended and in all ventilation we always try to make sure that the alveoli are not over distended and although we cannot measure the volume inside the alveoli we can measure the pressure inside the alveoli by looking at the plateau pressure and one of the goals of protective lung ventilation is to maintain the plateau pressure less than 30 cm of water so a plateau pressure exceeding 30 cm of water suggests that the alveoli are getting over distended and we need to do something to protect the lung to reduce the that of pressure and we can come to that a little later but i hope you got the overall concept of peak pressure and plateau pressure and the plateau pressure is extremely important from, from the point of view of lung protection and knowing the volume inside the alveoli okay and the peak pressure is very important because it also depends on the airway resistance right so a high peak airway pressure if the peak airway pressure is high it suggests that the there is either an increase in airway resistance or a decrease in lung compliance 
or a high tidal volume which also will cause the peak pressure to go up on the other hand the plateau pressure the plateau pressure only depends on the compliance of the lung so the difference between the peak and the plateau pressure is actually an index of the resistance of the airway so let's say in a patient who has got bronchospasm we'll have the peak pressure going up because the airway resistance has increased but the plateau pressure will be normal will be normal that is because the compliance of the lung is is still normal and so the peak so the peak will be high the plateau will be normal there will be a big difference between the peak and the plateau right so the peak to plateau gradient will be very high and if you start nebulizing the patient as the bronchospasm starts getting better you'll find the peak pressure coming down and coming a little and the peak uh, to plateau pressure difference coming becoming less and less right so the peak pressure and the plateau pressure are very important on the other hand the patient says a pneumothorax the lung compliance drops or she has pulmonary edema or develops a pneumonia then both the peak and the plateau pressure will go up because the lung compliance has gone down so with a resistance problem you will have a high peak and a normal plateau with a compliance problem you will have both the peak as well as the plateau pressure going up right so you have this is something you need to keep in mind it's uh, one way of if your peak pressure is going up you need to know why the peak pressure has gone up you do the plateau check the plateau if both the peak and plateau have gone up it says it's a compliance problem if only the peak has gone up but the plateau is normal it suggests it's a airway resistance problem so again this is what i was driving at so the high peak depend the the peak pressure depends on the resistance and compliance plateau depends only on the compliance so this part the difference between the peak and the plateau depends on the airway resistance right and this pressure the difference between the peak and the plateau pressure is called as the driving pressure so these are some of these terms which we will discuss uh, maybe not today in the next session but just keep this in mind when we are discussing ventilation okay is this part uh, reasonably okay i don't know i can't see any reactions over here but i hope i hope uh, i've made myself understood and i'd be happy to repeat this again if uh, maybe little later during the question answer session okay thank you dr binil okay so very important if you want to monitor a patient during volume control ventilation there is no you know you must always monitor the peak and the plateau airway pressures you also need to measure the uh, expired minute volume because if there's a leak then that can be uh, you can get loss of ventilation right during pressure control ventilation there is no point monitoring airway pressure because that is being held constant right but you must measure the expired tidal volume and the expired minute volume because these will change depending on the resistance and compliance of the respiratory system so always make sure that you are monitoring pressures during volume control ventilation and always make sure you are monitoring the expired tidal volume and minute volume during pressure control ventilation okay we now come to actually the different modes of ventilation now uh so any breath given by any ventilator of any company of any manufacturer any kind of breath can be described in just three or four terms okay one is what opens the inspiratory valve or what is the condition which makes the inspiratory valve open and that we call as a trigger criteria so what triggers the breath is the beginning what makes inspiration or what starts inspiration that is trigger then we said that gas goes into the patient and in a volume control it is the flow rate which is controlled in pressure controlled it is the pressure which is being controlled so that is a limit right so in volume control the flow rate is the limit say 40 liters per minute or 60 liters per minute in pressure control the airway pressure is the uh, limit so i have set a limit of say 20 cm of water or 30 cm of water right so you must know what starts the breath what limits the breath right and once that you reach that limit criterion so once you reach that uh, criterion of 40 liters per minute uh, flow rate if you, that is what you set or 20 cm of water pressure if that is what you set then you will continue at that limit throughout the duration of the inspiratory time right and then maybe there might be an inspiratory pause and then something tells a ventilator to open the expiratory valve and start exhalation and this is called the cycling criterion so in short in short any breath can be described in terms of what triggers the breath what is the limit and what is the cycling criterion so these are simple things which we have to know for any mode of ventilation or whatever the ventilator is doing so please remember trigger 
limit and cycle this is how you describe the phases of any breath given by a ventilator okay so let's start with what triggers a breath right so what what triggers a breath so if the patient is completely apneic and you have set say a rate of 15 respiratory rate of 15 that means the ventilator knows that every 4 seconds it has to give a breath so that is a time trigger right on the other hand if the ventilator is set in such a way that i initiate a breath and then the ventilator takes over so in order for the ventilator to start a breath when i start taking a breath the ventilator has to know that i am breathing so that so that is sort of an assisted breath so ventilator knows when i am starting breathing and that will open the inspiratory valve and the two things two criteria which a ventilator looks at to decide whether the patient is breathing initiating a breath or not is the pressure or the flow rate right so we all know that when we start breathing there is a negative pressure that we generate right so the ventilator is will sense the negative a drop in airway pressure the negative pressure which is developed when we start breathing and then it will open the inspiratory valves that's called pressure triggering on the other hand when we start breathing there is a small change in flow rate right when when we when we initiate a breath so ventilator will sense the change in flow rate and then it will open the inspiratory valve that is called flow triggering and in general in electronics the engineers have found that flow triggering is more sensitive than pressure triggering and therefore most ventilators today are flow triggered ventilators so they sense a change in flow rate when the patient attempts a breath and that makes the patient that makes the ventilator open the inspiratory valve so that's flow triggering there is a new thing called neural triggering right and we'll talk about that a little later so essentially what happens now if you see this graph over here this is the airway pressure and this is time so here there's a a deflection right there's a small negative deflection which is a patient wanting to start the breath and then the, that has opened the inspiratory valve and triggered the inspiration so this is a patient triggered breath this is a breath where there has been no patient effort you can't you can't see any deflection below the x axis and this is a machine triggered or a ventilator initiated breath right is this clear if, if someone can put up a thumbs up i mean that'll be fine okay no one has put up but i guess it's okay okay now you know the breath every breath we as we said we the ventilator senses a either change in airway pressure or change in flow rate but the or, origin of breath is in the brain isn't it that is in our respiratory center because there's something in the uh, respiratory center is telling the uh, initiating the neural circuit which sort of starts the respiration so from the brain the impulse travels on the spinal cord to the phrenic nerve the phrenic nerve activates the diaphragm uh, and the diaphragm contracts and that diaphragm when the diaphragm contract it moves down there's a negative pressure which is created with lung expansion and then you get a uh, that is that is airway pressure is sensed by the ventilator and flow and so and flow or volume is sensed and that triggers the ventilator so this so essentially when you are doing pressure and flow triggering we are virtually sensing the breath at the end of the neural inspiration right so now what people have done is they've got a special sort of tube with electrodes like a rail tube with electrodes which senses the electrical activity in the diaphragm and when the so when they see the emg in the diaphragm and there's depolarization of the diaphragm they sense the electrical activity that triggers the ventilator that is called neural triggering and that may be a little more much more sensitive because it can pick up the uh, inspiration well before the mechanical changes have taken place and this is called neural uh, adjusted ventilatory assist or nava it's there in just one or two ventilators it's a interesting concept we won't go into great detail but just to uh, highlight the fact that you can have pressure or flow triggering but you can also have neural triggering uh, that that's the sort of technology which is available now now once the inspiratory valve has opened and gas flows in something has to tell the ventilator that okay now you stop giving that extra extra flow you start just flow now continue your uh, ventilation inspiration at this parameter and that is either pressure or flow rate right that's what we said so if it's a pressure controlled mode the inspiratory limit will be the pressure that we have set say 15 20 25 cm of water and if it is volume controlled ventilation it will be the tidal volume or basically like i mentioned the flow rate which is required to give that tidal volume so it will reach that limit right so the ventilator will continue that limit throughout the duration of the inspiratory time and then something has to tell the ventilator to change over to exhalation 
and that is called the cycling criterion. Now, if the patient is completely apneic and volume control is ventilation or pressure control ventilation has been given, then again, it is a time cycling. So when the inspiration, whatever the inspiratory time that is achieved, when you get that, when that inspiratory time is reached, the ventilator will change over to expiration. Uh, we don't have pressure cycling anymore in most ventilators are not in the old ventilators, old birds ventilators, if some of us may have used them, you know, they were pressure cycled. So as soon as a certain pressure was reached, the ventilator would switch over to expiration. There was a magnet which would get pushed when the pressure was reached, it would just detach and change over to expiration. So that's so the only time we have pressure cycled ventilation is when a high pressure alarm is reached. And you know, so if you may have, if you, if the, if you set a say a pressure alarm of 50 centimeters of water, if something happens and the airway pressure rises to 50, say because of severe bronchospasm, then to sort of protect the patient or the circuit, the ventilator will immediately change over to expiration. But other, apart from an alarm re being reached, you don't have pressure cycling in the current uh, ventilators over here. So most of the ventilators are time, uh, time cycle or maybe volume cycle, but, uh, and we'll talk about flow cycling a little later. And it's a very special form of cycling so but most just for the sake of argument most uh, ventilators are time cycle okay and expiration like i said it's a passive process the ventilator allows the gas to come out it comes out baseline which is airway pressure the only modification that can happen is we can set a positive and expiratory pressure so the exhalation will be up to the positive and expiratory pressure or peep okay now you know the reason why people are totally confused about modes of ventilation is, uh, you know, uh, different companies have different names and you have one ventilator and you, know, you say, oh, my, my ventilator gives me ABC mode. Another, you have someone has some other model, uh, different manufacturer and he says, oh, no, my ventilator gives me PQRS mode. And then you start fighting whether ABC mode is better or PQRS mode is better. When actually they're doing the same thing. And the reason is, you know, the companies are very smart. So they... Once the company makes a mode or designs a mode, they will patent it. And therefore, no other company can call it the same name. They have to call it something different. So you can have, you know, either CMV can, for some companies, control mode ventilation, for others, it's control mandatory ventilation, some call it all sorts of things. And the more complex the modes get, the more acronyms come up, right? And so one company has one set of alphabets and another one another set of alphabets. It's a big alphabet soup and it's very confusing. But at the end of the day, if we remember anything, any more that anyone talks about can be described in just a very few simple terms, right? What's, is it pressure control or volume control? What triggers the breath? What is the limit? And what is the cycling criteria? Any mode can be described in these terms, okay? And some modes can be either completely controlled. In, a, in other words, a patient is doing nothing. Everything is done by the patient or the ventilator is assisting the patient. In other words, the patient is initiating a breath and then the ventilator is taking over. So they could be either controlled or mandatory or assisted modes. So the simplest mode to understand is called is CMV. Now you can call it controlled mechanical ventilation, controlled mode ventilation or control, whatever. So here the patient is completely flat and the commonest thing during anesthesia and or when in the ICU when you've paralyzed the patient. Uh, so all breaths are mandatory. Right, you set the rate, you set the inspiratory time, you set the tidal volume if it's volume control ventilation, you set the pressure limit if it is pressure control ventilation. These are time triggered because if you set a say a respiratory rate of 12, then every five seconds the ventilator will give a inspiration. And they are volume or pressure limited, depend or, or flow limited, depending on the whether it's volume control or pressure control ventilation, and they're by and large they are time cycled. Okay, and you can forget about the other types of cycling. So essentially, they are time cycled. Okay, so if you look at the graphs, right? Uh, okay, and it's nice to look at the graphs. They also look very intimidating, but actually they are quite simple. So in flow rate, in flow, in a flow time graph, you always get a horizontal line, and the part above the line is inspiration. The part below the line is expiration. In pressure, you get just one part above the line over here. By and large, if there's a patient breath, there'll be a negative deflection below the horizontal line. So. If you remember this, if you see in this graph, there is no patient effort in any of the breaths. There is no negative deflection in the pressure time curve. So all breaths are mandatory. The patient is not breathing, right? If you remember, I said a decelerating flow waveform is the hallmark of pressure controlled ventilation. You can see that this is a decelerating waveform. So this is 
controlled ventilation or it is pressure controlled right pressure controlled cmv you can call it as a pressure controlled cmv and this is another patient and here again you can see there is no negative deflection so the patient is not breathing and here your the flow flow rate is constant flow so this is volume controlled cmv right so this is controlled ventilation now you can have a situation where the patient starts breathing or the patient is breathing and then what you have to do is the patient has to only start the breath and then the ventilator will synchronize and take over the do the rest of the inspiration so if you set a tidal volume and you set an inspiratory time and set an inspiratory flow rate the patient will trigger the ventilator and then the ventilator will give the breath with all the parameters that you have set and this is called assist control ventilator so each and every breath that the patient takes will be triggered by the will trigger the ventilator and the patient will get a breath so now you know this so if you see over here this is a patient breath because there's a negative deflection uh, pressure below the baseline so that patient is breathing all the breaths are then triggered by the ventilator are assisted by the ventilator and you can see this is volume controlled because this is a constant flow ventilation over here right so assist control ventilation is a very good mode because it tremendously reduces the work of breathing is it so the moment the pa all the patient has to do is start the breath and then the ventilator does the rest and each and every breath is taken over so it maintains very good gas exchange and it maintains reduces the work of breathing the downside of assist control ventilation was that if the patient uh, say becomes tachypneic starts giving a rate of 30 or 35 that means a ventilator will he will get 35 ventilator assisted breaths each and every breath will be assisted with a ventilator and that will wash out co2 also the patient spends a lot of time with positive pressure right Num so many positive pressure breaths it could be bad for the hemodynamics so that was the downside of assist control ventilation so when the engineer told you know, assist control is a very good breath but these are the two problems with assist control ventilation they came up with a solution they said okay we can now devise a mode where you tell us how many breaths you want the ventilator to give so we can set it up so the ventilator will give that those many breaths and the rest of the breaths will be spontaneously breathed by the patient so let's say the patient is breathing at a rate of 25 but i want only 12 breaths to be given by the ventilator so the ventilator will give 12 breaths and the remaining 13 breaths the patient will breathe spontaneously on his own and the ventilator will allow him to do that he'll open the valves and allow the patient to breathe the rest of the 13 breaths so this was very good because you know and uh, because then what would happen is that the hyperventilation would go away and because the patient was not taking too many breaths in positive not spending too much time in positive pressure maybe even the hemodynamic effects were less and if you were able to make sure that the patient that the patient's effort and the ventilator mandatory breath was synchronized then there would be no clashing with the ventilator either so this was called synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation so simv and this was a very very popular mode because now uh, so what was it basically it synchronized breaths with spontaneous breaths allowed in between right now let's say the patient was sick initially and he needed lot of assistance you just set a higher simv rate so you set a simv rate of 20 as the patient starts getting better you allow the patient to breathe more and more so you reduce the simv rate and say come down to 15 come down to 10 come down to 6 and when the patient is ready to uh, is almost ready for extubation you can just give three or four simv breaths and you know the if he's doing well the patient is ready for extubation so simv was very popular because you could use it as a ventilating mode and also as a weaning mode isn't it so you just start reducing the simv rate and people actually fought forward which mode was better assist control or simv and simv seem to be a very very good mode and people thought we sort of uh, you know hit the jackpot as far as a mode of ventilation was concerned and simv seem to fit the bill so this is what simv was doing so if you can see again this is pressure controlled simv right this is because this is a decreasing flow during inspiration so here the patient has taken a breath it has been assisted by the ventilator this breath is not assisted by the ventilator this is a spontaneous breath which the patient is taking on his own so out of these three breaths the ventilator is assisting two and one is being breathed spontaneously by the patient so this is simv and all these breaths are synchronized right so this is simv so here he gets a good tidal volume here he gets a small tidal volume with a spontaneous breath and here he gets a good tidal volume now people thought simv was a wonderful mode until people did weaning trials 
and in weaning trials they compared <coughs> a direct tp weaning they compared pressure support weaning and they compared simv as a mode of weaning and there were two large studies one was done in italy in france and one was done in italy one study found that pressure support weaning was the best one study found that tp weaning was the best but both studies found that simv weaning was the worst and this was a big blow and the reason is and the reason was that you know if the patient spends takes a lot of spontaneous breaths right and is there has many breaths which are not assisted by the ventilator his work of breathing may actually increase and if the patient is recovering he probably needs to continue to have assistance and not reduction of uh, mandatory breaths and allowing the patient to breathe spontaneously too often right in a in a minute or in an hour or something may actually you know and overcoming the circuit resistance and so on may actually land up with the patient doing more work during the spontaneous breaths than during the mandatory breaths and if you allow too many spontaneous breaths then maybe it increase the work of breathing rather than decrease the work of breathing and that resulted in weaning failures right so simv was just simv like this sort of what is not a very good mode to use okay so if you are just using simv without any assistance uh, like this then simv is probably not very good and assist control is probably better okay so now we come to a mode which is a very interesting mode called pressure support and initially it was designed because like i said you know there's a circuit resistance which the patient has to overcome during spontaneous breathing so people said you know if we apply a circuit pressure of about 5 to 7 cm of water it overcomes the resistance in the circuit and makes the makes it easier for the patient to breathe then it was realized if you increase that pressure level a little more then it actually augments tidal volume and the respiratory rate also reduces a little bit so you can use it as a mode to ventilate the patient so pressure support mode is now designed as a mode for completely spontaneous breathing there is uh, you know the ventilator is not st uh, starting or ending the breath that is done by the patient so the, right so the patient uh, there is no time control in this sort of uh, in this breath right so on inspiration so when the patient triggers the breath and you have say a set a pressure support of say 15 then the patient will receive pressure to that limit of 15 and the lung will expand now remember i said that the inspiration as the expiration is determined entirely by the patient because uh this is a completely spontaneous mode the ventilator is not controlling any of the timings how does the ventilator know that the patient now wants to exhale right so patient the ventilator has to know when to open the expiratory valve and the expiratory valve has to open when the patient is ready to exhale and the patient is ready to exhale when the lung is full right so how does the ventilator know that the lung is full remember when we talked about a, a decreasing flow we said that the flow decreases in pressure controlled ventilation or pressure limited ventilation when the lung is getting more and more full so what the engineers did is they said okay if the pressure airway pressure if the flow rate sorry if the flow rate decelerates to 25% of the peak inspiratory flow we will assume that the lung is nearly full and that will open the expiratory valve right so in other words it's now so what is happening is something like this now so the patient has reached a peak inspiratory flow rate the flow rate is decelerated when the flow rate comes down to 25% of the peak flow the ventilator assumes that the lung is full it's not really full it is almost full because it will be full when the flow rate decelerates to zero but when it comes down to a very low flow rate the ventilator will assume that the lung is full and the expiratory valve will open and the expiration will start okay so if patient inspires takes a breath that triggers a ventilator reaches the pressure support level and then changes over to expiration this is pressure support ventilation so pressure support ventilation is patient triggered pressure limited and flow cycled because this is a cycling which takes place with flow rate right so this is pressure control ventilation uh, pressure support ventilation entirely specific how do you set the pressure limit so that you get your desired tidal volume at that desired tidal volume you should get a slight reduction in the respiratory rate very important you must always set an apnea backup because suppose someone by chance gives say a big dose of morphine or by accident gives a uh, muscle relaxant then this is a completely spontaneous mode if the patient doesn't trigger there will be no ventilation so you have to set a backup 
pressure control or volume control mode in case the patient stops breathing. So that's a very important thing you need to keep in uh, pressure control, pressure support ventilation. And now if you remember, I said in pressure in SIMV, it was not a good mode because the spontaneous breaths were not assisted by the patient. The patient was doing all the work of breathing. But if you add pressure support to those spontaneous breaths, then the work of breathing will be reduced, right? So then if at all you use, therefore, SIMV, you have to use SIMV with pressure support so that you get some mandatory breaths from the ventilator and the spontaneous breaths are assisted with pressure support, which greatly reduces the work of breathing. So today we no one uses SIMV. If at all you use SIMV, always use with pressure support. So this is a mode called SIMV with pressure support. So SIMV plus pressure support. Okay. The last mode I want to talk to you is basically PRVC. Now, you know, so PRVC is there on many ventilators. And again, it's confusing because some ventilators have it called auto mode, some call it PRVC, some call it something else. But PRVC is a misnomer. You know, when you say pressure regulated volume control, many people assume it's a volume control mode of ventilation, but actually it's a pressure control mode of ventilation. And it's an interesting mode because it's a dual control mode of ventilation. So let's say, so basically it is pressure control, right? Basically it is pressure control ventilation. And remember the big drawback of pressure control ventilation is the tidal volume is not guaranteed. If the airway resistance or compliance changes, then you can get a drop in tidal volume. So now the engineers have devised a way of guaranteeing tidal volume during pressure control ventilation. So, <clears throat> so what happens in pressure control ventilation? You tell the ventilator, I want tidal volume of 500 ml, okay? So the vent the ventilator will calculate how much pressure it needs to give to generate that tidal volume. So it will estimate that and start ventilating, let's say, a pressure of uh, 20 centimeters of water. Let's say I need 25 centimeters to give tidal volume of 500 ml, right? So I set the tidal volume, 500, ventilator calculates the pressure required, and it starts ventilating with 25 centimeters of water pressure. So it gives pressure control ventilation with the pressure limit of 25 centimeters of water. Then after a few breaths, the ventilator will check the delivered tidal volume, okay? If the delivered tidal volume is less than the target, so let's say instead of 500, I'm getting only 400 tidal volume, the ventilator will automatically increase the pressure limit to say 28, right? And then it will again check the tidal volume and will keep on increasing the pressure until I get a tidal volume of 500 ml, okay? On the other hand, Let's say I've set 500 at that 25 pressure, it gets, I'm getting 700 ml tidal volume. Then the ventilator will reduce the pressure in the next breath to say 22 centimeters and it'll keep on reducing the pressure limit until it gets the target tidal volume. On the other hand, if the tidal volume is equal to what is set, then it'll continue ventilating at the same pressure control level. So basically it keeps adjusting the pressure control level to get the desired target tidal volume. So I think, uh, okay. So I think uh, what you also need to keep in mind, three golden rules. Never silence any alarm on the ventilator until you sorted out what the problem is. Don't just keep pressing the alarm and switching it off, okay? If there's a problem, umbu the patient. So we'll have a 15 lakh ventilator, but make sure you've got a 1,500 1, rupee umbu bag on the patient, right? So in case there's any problem, you can always ventilate the patient manually while you sort out what the problem is. So always keep an AMU bag behind the patient and always look after the general care of the patient. And what we say is give the patient a fast hug that is feeding, enteral nutrition, analgesia, sedation, intermittent cessation, thromboprophylaxis, head elevation, uh, pressure and gastric ulcer prophylaxis and glycemic control. So look after the patient, look after all the general care of the patient. And you know, all these modes are very nice, very complex, very interesting to talk about. But please remember the biggest trial, which has made a big difference to ventilation in ARDS, reduced mortality from ventilation, has focused on the strategy of ventilation rather than a mode of ventilation. The mode of ventilation actually used is a very simple volume assist control mode. Okay? So it is a strategy which is more important than the mode. And how you use a strategy is the important thing. And that is what we'll discuss in the next session. Right? So just get the basics right. Remember the KISS principle. Right? Don't get ideas. It's, it's, KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid. Read your ventilator manual. See what your individual ventilator does in your unit. And thank you very much for listening. And next time we will talk on uh, how you can use strategies of ventilation to improve outcome in different uh, districts.
in different settings in different conditions okay so thank you very much for listening and happy greetings for easter to all of you thank you very much i'll be happy to take some questions if there are any thank you sir thank you very much uh, at present we don't have any questions in the chat box so somebody wanted to sme repeat sme or something uh, yes sir that, that is there somebody asked to repeat the sim they can uh, actually it, it will be there in the youtube also the, the, the recordings will be in the youtube and they'll be able to watch again in the youtube if they log into the youtube channel uh, okay so sir uh, at present we don't have any questions so we can wait for the questions in the chat box if you got time sir okay no problem then we will move on to the next uh, presentation uh, it is uh, drugs in anesthesia by dr sanish pj and dr polo polo rafael dr polo rafael is the internal for today he is the professor and hod of amala institute of medical sciences uh, trichur he is an authorized um, uh, instructor for uh, ha scls and bls courses also uh, he is an irc instructor for cols ccls and bcls he got uh, several presentations uh, in the prestigious journals and uh, he he presented uh, so many lectures in cmes and conferences and workshops and our second speaker is dr sanish pj he is the external for today he is a senior consultant in anesthesiology and critical care in anandapuri hospitals uh, and research institute trivandrum actually for pgs they, they, dr sanish uh, pg uh, doesn't require any introduction because he routinely takes classes for pgs his academic ventures are uh, one youtube channel is there and another is one website i would like to share his uh, uh, the the address for his uh, website yeah you can uh, see this website is www.onlineanesthesiatools.com and it's very famous and he also uh, uh, maintaining webinar campus and routinely he is taking classes for the pgs he is author of two textbooks and he got uh, many publications in index journals and he got lectures in cmes and conferences and workshops so over to the uh, presenters dr paul or rafael please thank you thank you binil for the introduction and a good evening to all uh, first of all let me thank the isa kerala state chapter and the uh, the team uh, the pg update team for giving us the opportunity to conduct this session as you all know today's session will be uh, the part 1 of the drugs used commonly used in anesthesia and today we'll be dealing with the neuromuscular blocking drug and reversal agent the idea of presenting uh, uh, conducting this session is not only to uh, make you familiarize with the questions uh, asked in the viva but also to guide you how to answer it in a, in the proper way uh, dr sanish uh, uh, as you all know is the uh, elect, uh, uh, is a youtuber also and uh, very uh, very familiar with uh, uh, most of you will be familiar with him and he has prepared in such a manner uh, that each one of you will be able to uh, answer uh, the questions uh, and how to put it uh, in the proper and the ideal way and we have today uh, for as the candidates uh, to pgs they are from amala institute of medical sciences thrissur dr charuda and uh, dr minu uh, i welcome both of, both of you Ch dr charida and dr minu now yeah. over to dr sanish thank you thank you very much uh, dr paul and thanks isa kerala pg update organizers for uh, this opportunity to be part of this uh, great continuing academic venture so uh, today our target will be to cover Uh, part 1 of drugs in anesthesia will uh, mainly concentrate on neuromuscular blockers and reversal agents my slide is visible right it's visible yes visible visible fine fine so uh, today we have um, uh, two pg delegates from um, amala 
uh, institute and um, i think both of them are there you can unmute and uh, wait for the questions before we go get into the business um, i would like to throw some light on how to present um, the drugs viva station because knowing is something how you present is a different thing and the examiners mostly will be rating you or grading you on the basis of how you present it it's simple okay most of the time you will be given an option to pick up a drug and speak and my personal advice would be you should be having at least four or five four or five uh, strong drugs in your um, armamentarium because given a choice you don't pick a drug and dig your grave okay whichever drug you pick you should be able to talk on it for uh, maybe 3 minutes 5 minutes depending on the examiner's um, uh, uh, timing okay so the best thing is you should have a few drugs which on which you are very strong be it an induction agent neuromuscular blocker or local anesthetic you should be familiar and you should be thorough with it if examiner picks up a drug which you are not familiar that's the part of the game you can't do anything about it now when you prepare for the drugs by the station how do you prepare most of the time we find that the moment somebody a candidate picks up a drug he or she starts talking on some aspects and goes on elaborating on that particular aspect it would be better if you have a systematic approach when you present a drug here i am giving a broad idea because uh, it's subject to uh, modification depending on your strength uh, basically you should introduce the drug if possible the chemical composition say this is 1% propofol 26 diisopropyl phenol uh, and the class of drug iv induction agent how it acts salient features and what all preparations available definitely what preparation is given in front of you should be mentioned suppose when 1% propofol is there you should say 1% propofol uh, 12 ml ml ampule or uh, 10 ml vial is available that you can always mention plus when you describe the common uses common things first okay it will be nice if you mention on what dose you give and do not forget to mention the route of administration suppose for example ketamine if you say it is um, uh, 1 to 2 mg per kg unless you specify whether it is intravenous or intramuscular it may not carry the weightage because you will be inviting questions from the examiners and the road might take a different turn and the effects on systems you can have a logical sequence maybe cardiovascular first respiratory cns renal hepatic like that um adverse effects basically you uh, stress on what are commonly observed things rather than going for rare adverse effects and uh, specific concerns or highlights you can mention after that okay so you can have some examples and when it comes to compare and contrast this is where most of my um, pg friends go wrong because if you are given two or three drugs there is a general tendency to start describing one drug and then probably thinking that you will get enough time to come to the second drug but it will be nice if you introduce both the drugs or if there are three drugs like here isoflurane desflurane and serflurane introduce all three and give the class mostly they will belong to same class or probably maybe succinylcholine versus rocuronium one is depolarizing one is non depolarizing how they act what are the salient features what are the preparations available of, of course when you speak about uh, volatile agents you can um, mention about the physical characteristics and uh, things like uh, mac comparison blood gas partition uh, coefficient comparison like that then effects on system cardiovascular when you describe one cardiovascular system describe the effects from isoflurane 
then go to desflurane, then go to serflurane, then jump into the next system. So that will make your answer more uh, systematic and compact. When you mention about adverse effects, try to put in these key salient adverse effects, which actually contrast with the other drug. Specific concerns or highlights you can mention after that. So this kind of a pattern, if you have in mind, and in case you get one of the drugs unexpected from your regular prepared armamentarium, you can modify because um, you give the composition of your strong drug and then try to give the composition of the next drug. So your answer will be more systematic. So here uh, we'll start with the neuromuscular blocking drugs and uh, reversal agent. I know that uh, neuromuscular junction physiology has been dealt in Kerala ISA PG update a few weeks back and uh, neuromuscular monitoring is also done. So um, I will quickly rush through the um, history of uh, the neuromuscular blocking drugs when my friends waiting for the questions will uh, relax and get ready for the questions. So our journey starts from 1942 when D-tubacurarin came into play with uh, Griffith and Johnson. Then 1952, our uh, time-tested succinyl choline came. Then 1967, pancronium came into the picture. 1980s, vicronium and atracurium came in. Rocuronium and mivacurium came in 1990s. And recently, even cis-atracurium is available in our country as well. So I think, um, shall I start with uh, Dr. Charita? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you mention, um, how do you want to classify neuromuscular blocking drugs? Yes, sir. Uh, neuromuscular uh, blocking drugs can be broadly classified uh, based on the duration of action, based on their chemical composition, and based on the mechanism of action. Okay. Based on the mechanism of action, it is classified into depolarizing and non-depolarizing. Right. And based on the uh, composition, it is uh, classified into stero amino steroids, benzyl isokinolonium, and uh, you know, asymmetric omium fumarates. And based on the duration of action, it is classified into short, uh, long acting, intermediate acting, short acting, and ultra short acting. Okay, excellent. Can you give the examples of um, uh, different duration of action classification? Uh, long duration of action. Uh, it is both of uh, both the type of steroids and uh, benzyl isokinolonium. In uh, steroids, it is pancuronium long acting, that is uh, more than 50, 50 minutes, and D tubocurarin in case of benzyl isokinolonium. Intermediate acting, uh, that is duration between 20 to 50 minutes. It, uh, from steroids, it is uh, uh, vecuronium and rocuronium. From benzyl isokinolonium, it is atracurium and cisatracurium. In case of short acting, uh, the benzyl isokinolamine is mevacurium. And in case of ultra short acting, the depolarizing, uh, depolarizing drug, succinyl choline, and uh, gantacurium uh, from asymmetric onion fumarates. Okay, excellent. That was an excellent start for this um, viva station. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Dr. Minu? Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you pick up uh, this drug and uh, speak on it? So this is succinyl choline, uh, which is actually a depolarizing muscle relaxant. This is an ultra, it, uh, it's, uh, it's an ultra short acting drug. Uh, duration is about four to 10 minutes. And uh, uh, it is actually two molecules of acetyl choline uh, linked together with an acetyl methyl group. Uh, its mechanism of action is, uh, it, it's, it's a depolarizing muscle relaxant. So it causes prolonged depolarization of the end plate. And this results in desensitization of the uh, acetylcholine receptor and inactivation of sodium channels in the neuromuscular junction, also increasing potassium permeability in the surrounding membranes, which finally leads to the uh, uh, failure of generation of action potential and it results in neuromuscular blockade. So uh, 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 the, intubating, uh, the intubating dose is 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg. Then uh, it is ideal for RSI, uh, we can uh, get a, uh, 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 the, uh, 
we it 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 uh, it's ideal for our site it's most it, it it is most rapid and predictable uh, uh, onset that is 60 to 90 seconds it has its ad95 is about 0.3 mg per kg now uh, it is uh, disintegrated by uh, the enzyme plasma cholinesterase or uh, also known as pseudocholinesterase or butyl cholinesterase now uh, it is it is it is dissociated into succinate monocholine and again it can undergo further it is actually a, it is only weak it contains only weak action at that of succinate choline again the succinate monocholine can be uh, metabolized to succ uh, succinic acid and choline its elimination t half is about 47 seconds then uh, it is uh, its ph is about 3.5 to 4 uh, its preparation is uh, 5 to 10 ml vial uh, and each ml containing um, uh, 50 mg per ml then regarding the uh, common uses, it is uh, used in RSI, a recommended dose is 1 mg per kg. And with this dose, we can get adequate integrated conditions in 60 seconds. Even 0.5 to 0.6 mg per kg is advised. Now, effects on systems, uh, it can, in, in serious, it can cause sinus, uh, uh, sinus, sinus bradycardia, moderate rhythms, ventricular dysarrhythmias, because of its action of cardiac mascarinic receptor. Then it can cause hyperkalemia, then it can cause uh, raised intraocular pressure, intracastic pressure, intra it can raise the uh, uh, ICP. Then it, it is also, uh, it can also cause myalgia, masseter spasm, and anaphylaxis incidents are also reported. Then uh, actually, it, it is actually a phase one blockade, but repeated doses, continuous infusion, uh, abnormal variant of uh, butyric coronary stress and say, can lead to a phase two blockade. Phase two blockade is actually uh, uh, is, uh, characterized by a failed, in, uh, failed response in muscle when we are giving continuous, when, when it is exposed to continuous exposure of depolarizing muscle relaxants. And this is uh, uh, thought to be uh, as a result of uh, the uh, depolarizing action of these agents on the presynaptic nicotinic, uh, presynaptic uh, acetylcholine receptor. Also, other factors can contribute, like uh, dose and duration, uh, type of muscle. Uh, concentration of the drug, etc., can contribute to this phase two blockade. Uh, then uh, another fact, uh, another thing uh, uh, with uh, respect to succinicolin is uh, dibuquin number. Uh, dibuquin is actually a amide local anesthetic. It can inhibit normal butyric cholinesterase more than uh, a typical uh, uh, butyric cholinesterase. Now, a number of eighty indicates normal enzyme. 20 to 60 indicates heterozygous atypical, atypical, and if it is uh, 20 to 30, it is homozygous uh, typical. Uh, it is not. It is not actually determining the concentration of the uh, enzyme. It is actually giving the uh, quality, the, the activity, the not the activity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was an elaborate description uh, because I have put some questions for the audience also. Now I would like uh, input from the audience. You will have a poll window projected now. Okay, you are, all you need to do is pick out the true statement or statements. That means more than one statement may be correct. Okay, so op statement A, succinylcholine is composed of two molecules of acetylcholine linked through the acetate methyl groups B, succinylcholine is the only available neuromuscular blocking drug with a rapid onset of effect and an ultra short duration of action. Succinylcholine induced neuromuscular blockade can be significantly prolonged if a patient has an abnormal genetic variant of butylcholine esterase. Op option D or statement D says, Dibuquin number measures the concentration of the enzyme in the plasma substrate. You can click on the um, poll window appearing now. Okay, I think uh, the poll window is visible now. You can start voting. Incidentally, Dr. Minu um, happened to touch upon these topics during her description on succinylcholine. 
So another uh, 10 seconds, we'll be winding up the poll. I request all the postgraduates to put in your responses. Okay, because all your responses will be recorded anonymously. There is no data security issue here. Okay, so I'm winding up the poll now. Okay, so this is the result. Dr. Minu, you would like to comment on this? Yes, sir. Uh, all, uh, first three options are correct. Sorry, first sir. three options are correct, actually. Okay. So um, I think um, only option B was not very popular. Maybe uh, they are contemplating on Gantacurium. Okay. That is a possibility, but this, this sentence is taken from Miller. So maybe it's not uh, the rapid onset of effect is not comparable with succinylcholine for gantacurium. But with regard to Dibuquin number, as Dr. Minu mentioned, it is not actually measuring the uh, plasma choline esterase. It's actually activity of genetic makeup of an individual with respect to your daily choline stress. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thanks uh, for all those who have put in their responses. Okay, uh, I think uh, during her initial description, she mentioned about uh, DBK number. And um, Dr. Minu, can you mention the factors that can lower the butylcholine esterase activity? Yes, sir. Uh, this uh, butylcholine esterase activity can be lowered in conditions like liver disease, in patients taking OCPs, pregnancies, old age, malnutrition. And when we are consuming drugs like uh, cytotoxic drugs, neoplastic drugs, then echothiophate, esmolol, uh, bambuterol, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, then other drugs like um, uh, metoclopramide, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, etc. These conditions, the activity will be lowered. Okay, so one point which will overlap with our conventional practice is most of the time when we give rapid sequence induction for a cesarean section where the uh, client happens to be a pregnant patient with possible lower uh, pseudocholinesterase activity, mostly we will be using succinylcholine for rapid sequence intubation. So how do you manage that? Uh, Dr. Minu? Uh, sir, uh, in pregnant patients, uh, we will give the higher, higher dose, uh, sir. Uh, no need, actually. I mean, the, uh, plasma choline esterase activity is lower. So, no need to give a higher dose. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Because, okay. yeah, because of uh, this uh, pseudocholine esterase effect is less, is lower, uh, uh, so? succinylcholine activity may be prolonged. That's the concern. So if you have a neuromuscular monitor instituted, you can uh, document a recovery from the blockade by the succinylcholine and then give the next um, intermediate acting uh, uh, neuromuscular blockade like uh, atracurium. Okay, fine. Uh, can you comment on succinylcholine induced cardiac dysrhythmias? Yes, sir. Uh... Three main uh, ca cardiac dysrhythmias are uh, uh, mentioned. That is, one is sinus bradycardia, uh, especially sinus bradycardia, nodal rhythms and ventricular dysrhythmias. Uh, sinus bradycardia is due to, uh, is due to especially seeing patients with high vagal tone, like in children uh, where we are not giving atropin. It is due to the main, mainly due to the action on uh, cardiac uh, mascarinic receptors on the SA node. Then it can also occur in adults. But most commonly seen after a, a, a repeated dose of succinylcholine, especially second dose. Then nodal rhythms uh, can be due to uh, the same effect only, the exaggerated effect on XA node. Uh, and the atrial ventricular node takes over the uh, role of pacemaker. Then ventricular dysarrhythmias are due to maybe, uh, uh, can be due to also, uh, the hyperkalemia caused by succinylcholine. Then uh, other factors like endotracheal intubation, hypoxia can also contribute to the uh, ventricular dysrhythmia. So. Okay, so uh, that's a debatable topic whether you should always give or routinely give anticholinergic drug before 
for pediatric um, patients prior to intubation, especially when you are using succinylcholine, the literature is swinging. Um, Dr. Charita, can you comment on the hyperkalemic effect of succinylcholine and your concerns? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, succinylcholine uh, increases the potassium level in the body it's due to the increased permeability of potassium at the end plate. And it is said that uh, administration of succinylcholine increases the potassium levels by 0.5 milliequivalents per liter. And uh, so it, uh, it should be used in caution with uh, patients having uh, increased serum potassium, like in case of spinal cord injuries, burns, and uh, other causes of uh, increased potassium. So uh, you need to have a, a ECG monitor. You should know whether the increment in the serum potassium value may be detrimental to the hemodynamic stability or not. You need to be prepared for that, especially when the patient is acidotic, maybe having terminal renal disease. So effect on intraocular pressure, how it affects your choice of succinylcholine for your anesthesia practice? Uh... Mm. Yes. That is it, me? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, succinylcholine increases the intraocular pressure, but uh, it is a study show that uh, the for giving uh, GA surgeries in case of increased uh, raised intraocular pressure surgery, it is not contraindicated uh, in uh, doing uh, procedures. Uh, may not be absolutely contraindicated. It's a transient you phenomenon. Can have, uh, you can have other measures to uh, deepen the plane and maybe use a lesser dose when you are concerned about this rise in intraocular pressure? Uh, it, has shown that it increases during the first three to four, uh, four to five minutes and it uh, drops after six minutes of the uh, administration of the drug. Okay. Fine. Can you uh, comment on pre-curarization, Dr. Charita? Yes, sir. Pre-curarization is uh, the administration of a non-depolarizing uh, muscle relaxant prior to the administration of succinylcholine uh, to uh, decrease the fasciculations produced by the succinylcholine. Usually, uh, we give uh, the dose of the drug that is approximately 10% of the ED95 uh, of the non depolarizing muscle relaxant. Uh, and rocuronine is the drug of choice for precurarization. Okay. Then what is self-taming? Uh, self-taming. Uh, Administering, uh, administering yeah, a small yeah. dose of succinylcholine uh, just before the intubating dose, so uh, the, uh, the so as to decrease the fasciculations. That is uh, about 0 0.1, 0 0.1 mg per kg is given before the actual dose. Sir. Five milligram or ten milligrams. Okay, Doctor Minu. Like uh, most of the time, we'll end up uh, we'll come across a scenario like uh, laryngospasm post extubation um, or um, post extubation um, desaturation will be tempted to go in for repeat intubation. So what is your concern when you are choosing succinylcholine for that? For laryngospasm yes, or post-reversal? We are expecting post-extubation laryngospasm uh, probably after, mostly, uh, uh, usually after reversal, after reversal of, uh, reversal of non depolarizing muscle relaxant. So uh, the problem with anticholinesterase drugs are they can also inhibit this butyl cholesterol. So we should be cautious in taking the do uh, dose, uh, the, 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 repeat, the, the dose of succinylcholine when we are managing post-extubation laryngospasm. The action may be prolonged. Okay, fine. Fine. Uh, scholine apnea or prolonged apnea following succinylcholine? Can you comment on that? Uh, it is the prolonged duration of action of succinylcholine. Uh, 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 due to the uh, it, because of uh, decrease in metaboli metabolization, resulting in uh, sustained paralysis. Uh, Scholin apnea can occur when uh, when the, when we are giving repeated doses of uh, uh, when we are giving repeated dose continuous infusion when there is abnormal uh, an abnormal variant of uh, butyl cholinesterase. Then in liver disease, pregnancy, and all uh, the. Uh, uh, the management is control ventilation. Um, phase two block. Uh, uh, yeah, phase two block can occur in this condition, and management is uh, control ventilation. Uh, uh, administration of fresh frozen plasma is also uh, documented. Then um, uh, use of call, uh, use of uh, call, call inhibitor drug like neostigmine 
can be given in normal individuals, but it is uh, the, but the role is un, the uh, the response will be unpredictable with persons okay. with abnormal genetic variants. So better to not give. Uh, we will ventilate till uh, the patients are out of this colon apnea. Okay, fine. Then you need to work up um, regarding the um, plasma choline stress level also in case that happens. Uh, Dr. Charida, um, yes. what is the impact of prior administration of succinylcholine on the subsequent non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drug dose? Uh, the uh, um, breeding uh, succinylcholine prior to non depolarizing drug increases, uh, uh, can enhance the uh, duration of action of the uh, muscle block. Um, and yeah, actually, we need not repeat a twice CD95 dose of uh, mm -hmm. the subsequent long acting or intermediate acting non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drug mm -hmm. and maybe the uh, those intubating dose is not required yes so you can manage with ed95 dose or maybe if you are monitoring you may get a longer duration of action uh, dr paul you want to add any questions here yeah? uh, what about the, the side effects of Succinyl choline. Dr. Mino? So, uh, the side effects can be uh, it can cause cardiac uh, arrhythmias, then hyperkalemia, it can cause raised intraocular pressure, then it can cause uh, raised intracranial pressure, also intragastric uh, pressure, uh, masseter spasms, and myalgia. And there are also reported incidents of anaphylaxis. It, it has got weak histamine releasing properties. So uh, anaphylaxis is also documented. These are the side effects. Yes. Okay. Um, can you mention what are the drugs metabolized by these esterases? I'm not only really speaking about uh, succinylcholine. So pseudocholine esterases. Will be uh, sir, uh, by this butyl cholinesterase. Back here, yeah. Then, uh, sir, uh, mean liver and plasma can... esterases. Okay. Okay, and other other anesthetics. Uh, local yeah. anesthetics. Okay. okay. Then red cell esterases. It's involved in the metabolism of esmolol, and a non-specific plasma esterase is involved in the metabolism of remifentanil. Okay, this is just for completion sake. Okay, now going back to the audience question. Uh, can you pick out the condition or conditions associated with upregulation of acetylcholine receptors? As uh, Dr. Minu mentioned, spinal cord injury, burns, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis. So your poll window will be there now. Yes. We'll wait for 20 seconds. These are favorite questions, favorite topic discussed during my investigations. Upregulation of acetylcholine receptors. Okay, fine. Yes. So people have chosen 76% said spinal cord injury, there is upregulation. Burns, 84% is most popular. Multiple sclerosis, 41% people are skeptical. And regarding myasthenia gravis, not even one third says there is um, upregulation of acetylcholine receptors. Dr. Minu, can you explain the answer? Yes, sir. Answers are uh, spinal cord injury, burns, uh, multiple sclerosis. Myasthenia gravis causes a down regulation of receptor. Yeah, so this is the um, more exhaustive list. Acetylcholine receptor upregulation happens in spinal cord injury, stroke, burns, prolonged immobility, prolonged exposure to neuromuscular blockers, multiple sclerosis, Guillain Barry syndrome, and down regulation of these receptors occurs in myasthenia gravis. Anticholine is poisoning, organophosphate poisoning. Okay, so option C is not there. Option A, B, and D are correct, involving with the upregulation of acetylcholine receptors. Okay, Dr. Sharida, your chance now. Yes, sir. You can go ahead describing this drug. 
this is vecuronium bromide. Vecuronium bromide uh, comes under the class of non depolarizing muscle relaxant of intermediate action. Uh, its mechanism of action is by the competitive inhibition uh, of the uh, competitive antagonist of acetylcholine receptor. And the salient features about the drug is that it comes as uh, 4 milligram or 10 milligram uh, vial or ampule in a lyophilized powder form because its solution is unstable. So it comes under uh, a powder form. Once diluted, it stays for 24 hours. And the common uses uh, of vecuronium uh, is uh, for the uh, endotracheal intubation, ICU sedation, and for uh, continuing of mechanical uh, ventilation. And the dose for vecuronium, the intubating dose uh, is 0.1 milligram per kilogram. Uh, the supplemental dose is 0 0.02 milligram per kilogram. And the uh, for the infusion doses, it is point. Uh, it is eight to uh, point eight to one micro microgram per kilogram per minute, and uh, the metabolism. It is mainly by uh, liver, uh, uh, liver, uh, liver metabolism, and it is partly metabolized by the kidney also. It is uh, it follows first order kinetics, and uh, effect on system. It is uh, relatively cardio stable, and there are no uh, no cardiac uh, adverse effects, and. Um, um, Okay, and we'll take a break now. We'll go back to the audience poll now. We'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Chariza, with the remaining part of the discussion. Yes, sir. So, audience poll question number three pick out the true statement or statements. That means more than one can be correct. Vecuronium is an aminosteroid neuromuscular blocker. Vecuronium is the N demethylated derivative of pancuronium. Vicaronium molecule is stable in solution. Vicaronium has an active metabolite, 3 des acetyl vicaronium, that has 80% of the effect of vicaronium. Okay. Pick out your choices. Your poll window is appearing right now. Yes, you are in the right direction. I'm happy that uh, most of the delegates attending the poll have uh, come red. Yes, I'm winding up the poll now. If you know, more people want to vote, you can vote now. Okay. Fine. I hope you can see the poll result. It's an aminosteroid. No doubt, 87%. Still, I am wondering why the small 13% had doubt on it. Okay, Vicaronium is in demethylated derivative of pancoronium, 76%. That again is a correct answer. Option C, only 22% is going with it, is stable in solution. And um, that's a wrong answer. Okay because it's not stable in solution. That's why it is getting dispensed as a lyophilized powder. So we dilute and make it, okay. 69% had no doubt that uh, option D is correct. Actually option D is also correct. Vecuronium has an active metabolite. Three des acetyl vecuronium that has 80% of the effect of vecuronium, which may be significant in some conditions like uh, hepatic dysfunction. So here's the answer. Vecuronium molecule is not stable in solution. That's why it comes as powder. Okay, what are the preparations of vecuronium available? It is available as vecuronium bromide. Okay, a four milligram. Four milligram and 10 milligram. milligram. Both are there. Okay, so you mentioned the um, intubating dose, the infusion dose correctly. Okay, Dr. Paul, you want to add anything? About the dose they have mentioned. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. Dose you have mentioned? Dose? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, vacronium okay. has a vagotonic effect. That's why there is no rise in heart rate. Okay. Uh, especially when compared to pancronium where you can get a higher heart rate. So when you don't want a tachycardia, you can go for vacronium. Okay. 
Shall we move ahead? Okay, Dr. Minu. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so this drug is rocronin bromide. Uh, this belongs to the uh, class of steroidal neuromuscular blocking drugs uh, in non-depolarizing uh, uh, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. And its duration, based on duration, it comes under the category of intermediate acting. Then uh, its clinical features are: uh, it is of a low potency, it's low potency that is about six to ten times low potent than pancronium and vecronium. Uh, since it is low potent, it, is, it has got rapid onset of action. Then uh, it has it is stable in a solution that is it can be stored uh, the shelf at room temperature can be stored up to sixty days. Then uh, preparation is uh, uh, five ml vial, each ml containing. Uh, uh, 10 mg and the intubating dose is 0 0.6 to 1.2 milligram per kg. Then metabolism is by uh, 30 to 40 percent biliary and 30 uh, uh, biliary and 30 percent by renal. Then common uses it can be used as uh, for RSI because it has rapid onset of action. It gives uh, uh, adequate intubating conditions at 90 seconds when used in concentration of 1.2 milligram per kg. But uh, the problem is that at, at this dose, uh, the duration will double. That is from about 35 minutes to uh, uh, 35 minutes to 70 minutes. And that can, that can also, there is a chance, uh, tachycardia can also occur. Then uh, uh, other side effects is it, is it can cause hypersensitivity and also mild vagonitic action is there. Uh, then uh, the dose is, uh, uh, I think, uh, the intuitive dose is 0.6 to 1.2. And uh, when infusion, uh, for infusion, 9 to 12 microgram per kg per minute is the dose. And it is it, ED95 is about uh, 0.3 milligram per kg. Okay, um, I slightly disagree with you with regard to the um, onset of action. Um, Dr. Chaduta, if I choose 0.6 milligrams per kg um, on an average, how long will it take for me to get intubating conditions? Uh, with a 0.6 uh, milligram per kilogram, it takes two to three minutes. For rapid sequence induction, with 1.2 milligram uh, per kilogram, we give, get it 90 seconds. Okay, um, I'll show some references later. Okay, fine. Um, Miller says as 0.6 milligrams per kg should give you an intubating condition in around 89 plus in and around plus uh, maybe another 10 seconds. So in and around 90 seconds of time when you are giving at 0.6 milligrams per kg and when you double it, 1.2 milligrams per kg, you get uh, it at 55 seconds. So we'll check that uh, tabular form later. Ah, yes, sir. Okay, yes. fine. So, so why is it uh, very much preferred in rapid sequence induction? especially for trauma? Because there is an increased potassium level in uh, trauma cases and succinyl choline is contraindicated. So we get, get a rapid, uh, rapid induction with rocuronium. Okay, especially we are, we are worried about the raised ICP, raised intraocular pressure and uh, risk of hyperkalemia when there is a massive uh, muscle injury. Then the next available choice is rocuronium. And if you don't anticipate and difficult intubation, then you can go ahead with a larger dose, maybe four times the ED95 dose, and yes. probably you can achieve a laryngoscopy and intubation uh, around 60 to 90 seconds. That's the advantage of that. Okay, Dr. Charita, you can go ahead with this attraction. We'll come back with the, some more features when we discuss the compare and contrast. Yeah, Kukulik, mm -hmm. attraction. Okay, uh, so atracurium is a non depolarizing muscle relaxant of uh, the benzyl isokinolonium uh, type and it is an intermediate action. And uh, it, uh, it mechanism of action uh, is it, it is a competitive in, uh, antagonist of the acetylcholine receptor. And uh, the salient features uh, are that, uh, that it is uh, it is an intermediate uh, action drug. And uh, it, uh, preparation is uh, available as uh, 2.5 ml uh, vial, uh, each ml containing 10 mg per ml. Is and uh, or ampule? Uh, ampule, ampule. Okay. And uh, uh, its metabolism is uh, uh, mainly by Hoffman elimination 
Um, it uh, Hoffman elimination, one third part is by Hoffman elimination and two, two third by non-specific ester uh, hydrolysis. Okay. And it is uh, the advantage of atracurium is that it uh, it can be given in patients with uh, renal and uh, liver dysfunction. And the metabolite uh, of atracurium uh, is uh, laudanosin. And laudanosin has a CNS stimulating activity and it can decrease the seizure threshold. Also, uh, another disadvantage of atracurium is the histamine uh, release in case of rapid injection of more than 0.4 milligram per kilogram uh, due to the histamine release and it can lead to uh, tachycardia, hypotension and flushing. And so uh, the injection should be given very slow over uh, 60 seconds. And um, the common uses of atracurium is uh, for endotracheal intubation and the uh, effect on side effects, uh, side effects, and it has no direct effect on CVS, but uh, due to the histamine release, uh, it causes the CVS uh, side effects like hypotension and tachycardia. And... Um, okay, fine. Uh, can you explain what is um, Hoffman's elimination? Okay. Hoffman's elimination uh, is a non-enzymatic chemical uh, degradation at physiological temperature and pH. Okay, fine. So uh, which other drug has a better percentage of Hoffman elimination compared to atracurium? It is cisatracurium. Cisatracurium has 77% of Hoffman elimination. How about atracurium? Atracurium, it is one third of the... Uh, 33 to 37%. Yeah, major disadvantage is uh, possibility of histamine release, which has been studied over different uh, doses of uh, atracurium. Dr. Minu, yes, please sir. go through cis-atracurium description. Yes. Cis-atracurium uh, is actually a non depolarizing muscle relaxant, belong to the category of benzyl acetonolene group of drugs. It is actually 1R cis, 1R dash cis isomer of cis-atracurium. Then it is four times as potent as uh, atracurium and it is intermediate acting. Uh, uh, one difference between atracurium is that it has no histamine release. Uh, it can be used in patients with uh, liver failure. or uh, 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 It has no property of histamine release. And its metabolism is mainly, as we said, its metabolism is mainly by Hoffman elimination. Uh, no acetohydrolysis is seen. 80% uh, of it uh, undergoes Hoffman elimination. And it is since it is four times more potent than a track, uh, less laudanosin will be generated. Then there is or, also organ dependent, uh, means element, uh, organ dependent, 23% uh, of uh, uh, metabolism is by organ dependent means. And out of this, 16% is through renal. Then dose is about uh, 0.15 to uh, 0.2 milligram per kg. And its preparation is 5 ml vial with each ml containing 2 mg. Then uh, infusion doses are 1 to 2 microgram per kg uh, per minute. Then maintenance is 0 0.02 milligram per kg. Okay, fine. So the advantages you have already mentioned. So we'll go to the audience quickly for uh, audience question. Pick out the true statements. Statement A, atracurium is a mixture of 10 optical isomers. Option B, mevacurium is hydrolyzed by plasma hydrolyzed in plasma by butyl choline esterase. Option C, laudanosin, a metabolite of atracurium has CNS stimulating properties. Option D, neuromuscular blocking drugs have excellent penetration through the blood brain barrier. So I expect uh, more participation from the postgraduates here. Yeah, your poll window is there now. Pick out the true statement or statements. You can click on whichever statement you feel is true. More than one, you can click. Yes, 20 seconds. I am closing it. We'll see the results. Dr. Menu, would you like to go through? You can see the results, right? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Um, can you go through the uh, options? Atracurium is a mixture of 10 optical isomers. It's true, sir. It's true. It's true. So only 56% said true, but it is true. Mivacurium is hydrolyzed in the plasma by butyl choline esterase. Yes, sir. True. That's again true. So next time, the 74% should come to 100%. Laudanosin, a metabolite of atracurium, 
has CNS stimulating properties. No doubt, 94% test the right answer. Next time, um, the two friends who missed out also should say laudanosin has CNS stimulating property that decreases the seizure threshold. Okay. Option D, not many people are uh, fancying about it. Neuromuscular blocking drugs have excellent penetration through the blood brain barrier. False. It's false. That is false. false. Okay. So these are not crossing the blood brain, blood -brain barrier. barrier. Okay. I think the answers are clear. This is for uh, clarity. Quiz three statements are clear. And uh, these neuromuscular blocking drugs, they do not penetrate through the blood brain barrier. Okay, now coming to drug comparisons, who wants to take the first question? Dr. Sarida or Dr. Minu? Your choice. Both are very happy. <laughs> okay, we'll go by <laughs> alphabetical order then. Dr. Sarida first. Okay, yes. Quickly, only the salient features because we have described the drugs. Snake colon is a non depolarized, uh, depolarizing muscle relaxant, while vecuronium is a, a non depolarizing muscle relaxant. Okay. So, snake colon uh, is an ultra short, uh, ultra short acting drug, vecuronium is an intermediate uh, acting drug. Okay. And the uh, uh, mechanism of action is by depolarize, depolarizing muscle relaxant by desensitization of the channels. Mm -hmm. And the vecuronium, uh, it is by uh, competitive inhibition uh, of the acetylcholine receptors. The dose of succinyl choline uh, for intubation is uh, one, uh, one milli milli milligram per kilogram, while acuronium it is uh, 0.1 milligram per kilogram. And uh, uh, maybe the major uses, common uses. Common uses of succinyl choline uh, is mainly for rapid sequence induction and uh, uh, for uh, uh, post extubation uh, laryngospasm. Macronian, uh, 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 um, not much fancy I, for uh, rapid sequence induction because it's, it's not used in rapid sequence induction. Okay, fine. So the uh, salient adverse effects of succinyl choline? Uh, succinyl choline adverse effects are uh, hyperkalemia, uh, cardiac dysrhythmia, increased ICP, increased intragastric pressure, increased uh, ocular pressure, masseter spasm, and myalgias. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, vecuronium has a vagotonic effect and it causes bradycardia in some times. Uh, and it cannot, it is made, the excretion is mainly by uh, liver. So it cannot be given in patients with liver or uh, renal dysfunction. No, no, you, you can't say it cannot be given. Maybe um, single dose can be given. Then you have to monitor and give. you have to have dose adjustments. The side effects part actually you should mention along with the mesetus spasm, uh, malignant hypothermia okay. also. Okay. This is one of the trigger factors for mm -hmm. malignant hypothermia. Okay, fine. So uh, this is the pattern I wanted to stress for the audience. So Dr. Minu, your chance, atracurium versus cis-atracurium. Uh, atracurium, uh, uh, both belong to the category of non depolarizing muscle relaxants and same category only, benzene as a quinoline group of drugs. And also they both belong to the intermediate acting, uh, intermediate duration, of action of neuromuscular agents. Then uh, attract, uh, uh, regarding atracurium, uh, 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 cis -attract, cis is the uh, uh, one half, one half dash cis isomer of atracurium. Then it is uh, compared to atracurium, cis is more potent. It is about four times more potent. Uh, and regarding the metabolism, atracurium is, has got mainly two pathways of metabolism. That is Hoffman degradation and non-specific ester hydrolysis. Why cisatracurium has got 80% uh, of Hoffman degradation and uh, organ dependent means contribute about 23%. Out of this, we, we can 16% uh, is renal. Then there can be uh, the laudanosin is the metabolite of atracurium, and uh, this is more and more seen with atracurium metabol metabolism compared with cisatracurium uh, because uh, cisatracurium is more potent. Then it can be uh, attract has the property of histamine release. Then rice is attract has no property of histamine release. So uh, uh, then uh, it can, attract can be since it has organ independent means of degradation. We can use uh, can, it can be safely used in patients with hepatic or renal failure. Uh, so attract can can be, cannot be can, can be also used safely with patient, uh, hepatic failure, uh, renal failure also. 
then uh, in pre preparations uh, we have uh, 2.5 ml uh, ampule with uh, each each ml containing 10 mg sisotrac comes in 5 ml vials with each ml containing uh, 10 mg okay then, uh, 5 ml ampules are also available which are the uh, other drugs which can cause histamine release? Vivacurin, Vivacurium, succinyl choline. Succinyl choline, sir. D2 bacurare. D2 bacurare. Highest is with D2 bacurare. Okay. And regarding cisatracurium, uh, like you are using cisatracurium, no? sometimes mm -hmm. you find uh, the action is not adequate. What may be the reason? It's most commonly due to the disruption of the cold chain, sir. Cold chain, sir. It needs to be stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. Yes, okay. Because otherwise it may undergo an organ independent temperature and pH dependent degradation. Okay. Okay, fine. Similarly, there can be a question on Vecuronium versus Rocuronium. We are not going into that. We'll go to the audience again. Pick out the drugs with succinyl uh, uh, histamine release. Succinylcholine, atracurium, cis atracurium, and mivacurium. I think uh, those who have listened to the talk, they sh should get it easily. The yes, the audience poll is on. Yes, I'll wind up the poll in another uh, five seconds. It's a very short and brisk response question. Yes. Yeah. For 93%, there is no doubt about atracurium. 77% succinyl choline came up. Mevacurium, 82% said yes. But I don't know why 23% um, said uh, histamine release with cisatracurium. Okay. So apart from cisatracurium, all the drugs mentioned here have um, histamine release. Okay, there is a table in uh, given in Miller regarding uh, the histamine release and the extent of histamine release. Yeah, this is the table. Okay, D tubercurin has the maximum histamine release. Succinyl choline, slight, mevacurium, atracurium size, uh, cisatracurium, none, and uh, nothing with the vecuronium, rocuronium, and pancuronium. Okay, just to summarize the intubating doses, this is the comparison trend. I prepared from the table given in the Miller, succinyl choline 1 milligrams per kg, rocuronium 0.6 milligrams per kg, vicuronium 0.1, pancuronium 0.1, mevacurium 0.15, atracurium 0.5, and cis atracurium 0.15. And uh, time to maximum block the onset, succinyl choline gives intubating condition around 60 seconds, rocuronium will take around 80 9 to 95 seconds, vecuronium almost 2.4 minutes, pancuronium might take uh, 4 minutes, mevacurium 3, atracurium 3.2, and the uh, twice ED95 dose of cis atracurium may take as high as 5.2 uh, minutes for the um, onset of intubating conditions. Clinical duration, succinyl choline less than 10 minutes, mevacurium around 15 minutes, Rocuronium, vecuronium, atracurium, it's around uh, in and around 40, and pancuronium might give you uh, the initial dose, intubating dose, twice ED95 dose might give you something beyond uh, uh, 80 to 100 minutes. Um, look, Charita, can you mention on quickly on timing technique? Because um, we are running short of time here. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, timing technique uh, is uh, actually giving the non depolarizing muscle relaxant before giving the general uh, induction of the anesthesia. Uh, while that is while the patient is awake, uh, we give uh, the full intubating dose of the non depolarizing muscle relaxant. And once the patient shows uh, signs of uh, muscle paralysis, uh, we give the induction doses. Er earlier signs of uh, dysphagia, central muscle group involvement. At that time, you should be starting the pre And we give the induction and doses. So the induction and we give an intubating condition within 45 seconds. Disadvantages? Uh, because it has a, a very di patient discomfort is very high. Yes. And uh, uh, so it is not currently used. Okay. Fine. How about the priming technique, Dr. Minu? So here, a small subparalyzing dose of non-depolarizing muscle relaxant is given. 
that is about 20% of ED95 or 10% of intubating dose, okay. four to five minutes before the uh, intubating dose. Okay. Uh, this is actually to, um, uh, to enhance the onset of blockade within 30 to 90, uh, 30 to 60 seconds. So as we can do endotracheal intubation within 90 seconds. The disadvantages okay. include um, a small degree of, a uh, small subtle degree of neuromuscular blockade occur with this dose. So it will be uh, distressing for the patient. There is chance of aspiration, difficulty in swallowing, etc. Then this is contraindicated in patients with abnormal airway anatomy and in patients with myasthenia gravis. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, how about um, Dr. Sarza? Can you uh, comment on the last dose regimen for rapid tracheal intubation? Uh, yes, sir. It can be said in case of rocuronium. Uh, we said that normal intubation dose for rocuronium is 0 0.6 milligram per kilogram. And we give the intubation conditions within 90 seconds. And when uh, the dose is doubled, that is 1.2 milligram per uh, deciliter is given. Uh, the intubation conditions is, uh, is, uh, is obtained at 55 seconds. And also uh, the duration of action is also doubled. Okay, that, that's actually the disadvantage, negative side of it, because we get committed to maintain the airway and maintain the ventilation for 73 minutes. So in case of unanticipated difficult airway, we'll have uh, disadvantages. And for shorter procedures, if you want to, um, just because you want to intubate uh, 30 seconds earlier, you'll be ventilating for another extra 40 minutes, which may not be acceptable in most clinical situations. Yes. Okay, so for trauma intubation, uh, rapid sequence intubation, it's a different story because we will be continually ventilating. Yes. Okay, regarding uh, metabolism and elimination, this is a kind of summary slide. Succinyl choline uh, depends on uh, pseudocholine esterase for 98% of elimination. Mibacurium, again, 95% um, dibutyl choline esterase. Procronium has uh, not much of metabolism part. Vecuronium, 40% by hepatic elimination uh, metabolism. Atracurium Hoffman elimination plus non specific ester hydrolysis accounts for 80% of the metabolism. And uh, one third is by Hoffman elimination. Cis atracurium Hoffman elimination um, accounts to 77%. Pancronium has 40% uh, liver metabolism. Uh, dependence on renal. It's less than 2% for uh, succinyl choline, 5% for mevacurium, almost 25% for uh, rocuronium, vecuronium, 40% by kidney, atracurium, less than 20% by kidney, cis atracurium, almost 16% by kidney, and pancuronium, it's much higher, almost 85%. And hepatic elimination, 70% for rocuronium, 60% for vecuronium, and 15% for pancuronium. So this is a comparison chart prepared from the table given the Miller. And the uh, metabolites, succinyl monocholine and choline for uh, succinyl uh, choline. And uh, vecuronium, 3-hydroxy metabolite, and same is the case with the pancuronium. And uh, atracurium, we are concerned with the laudanosin, which is not much uh, seen with cis atracurium. Okay. So interactions among non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agent because sometimes we'll be switching um, the neuromuscular blocking agents. So if you add the same group of uh, non-depolarizing agent, you get additive interaction. And sometimes synergistic when you get uh, mix up or uh, use two different kinds of uh, non-depolarizing blockers. Sometimes with um, on a combination like rocuronium plus mevacurium, you get additional advantage like rapid onset and short duration. And the sequence of non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, approximately three half-lives are required for a clinical changeover. Okay, So that 95% of the first drug has been cleared and for the duration of block to begin to take on the characteristic of the second drug, it takes three half-lives. That is when, uh, for example, when we start with the vacuronium and then switch over to atracurium, so after, even after we switch over to atracurium, three more half-life, the duration characteristics or blockade characteristics will be clinically similar to the first drug. Interaction between succinyl choline and non-depolarizing blocking drugs. Succinyl choline actually reduces the um, uh, dose requirement of the subsequent non-depolarizing blocking drug. Defasciculating does, uh, dose when we first give the non-depolarizing then actually there is a kind of resistance to succinyl choline and you may require 
higher dose of succinylcholine to get the same effects. Uh, Dr. Minu, can you comment on the uh, present recommendations of use of neuromuscular blocking drugs in the ICUs? Uh, sir, uh, so the indications where, where we use neuromuscular blocking drugs in ICUs are uh, when uh, facilitate for the facilitation of mechanical ventilation. Okay. Uh, that is for for, uh, for uh, endotracheal intubation for tolerating uh, for to uh, tolerating the tube. Then also when we need high pulmonary um, uh, pulmonary inflation pressures like in ARDS. Okay. Then when there are conditions of um, status uh, uh, status epilepticus, tetanus, then when we have to hyperventilate in case of raised ICP, uh, then uh, reduction in uh, reduction re reduction oxygen consumption, uh, like in uh, like in uh, abolishing uh, uh, reducing work of breathing and abolishing uh, shivering. Then uh, for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, for facilitation of the diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, these are the indications where we can where we use uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs in ICUs. Uh, infusions are not recommended. Bolus are better recommended. Then uh... okay, fine. Uh, what are your concerns when you limit the um, continuous usage of neuromuscular blockers in the ICU? Because you said there are only specific indications to continue, like uh, uh, severe neuroprotective measure in the early phase of uh, traumatic brain injury conditions like ARDS, you can give uh, neuromuscular blocking drugs. Yeah, what are your concerns? Uh, the metabolites are in, if, uh, if they're also having some uh, uh, other conditions like other, pro other diseases like liver failure and all, uh, if you are giving prolonged infusions, the metabolites can accumulate and cause prolonged duration of blocks. Yeah, plus it can result in critical illness, myopathy. Myopathy, cystic yeah. illness, myopathy. Okay, now let me go to the audience again. Pick out the recommendations for the use of neuromuscular blockers in the intensive care unit. Um, just click on those, uh, uh, those true statements. Do not administer for more than two days continuously. Administer by bolus rather than by infusion. Administer only when required and to achieve a well-defined goal. Continually allow recovery from paralysis. Okay, the poll window is coming now. Actually, this is just what we um, discussed now. Yes, I'm winding up the poll. Yeah. Fine. So uh, this is the response. Seventy-six percent believes all almost uh, first three question option. There is no doubt. I think majority agrees that uh, that is the case. No continuous administration of neuromuscular blocking drugs for more than two days. You should administer by bolus rather than infusion. Administer. Uh, only when required and to achieve well-defined goal. Continually allow recovery from paralysis. Only 50% said yes. There is uh, no doubt about it. That is again recommended uh, rather than continually paralyzing. You make sure the patient uh, monitor and see that the patient recovers from the neuromuscular blocking, uh, depth of blocking before you administer the next bolus. So these are the recommendations. Avoid use of neuromuscular blockers by uh, resorting to other measures like maximal use of analgesics and sedatives, manipulation of ventilatory parameters and modes so that there will be less of a synchrony. Minimize the dose of neuromuscular blocker as much as possible. So use a peripheral nerve stimulator with train of monitoring. Do not administer for more than two days continuously. Administer by bolus rather than uh, infusion. Administer only when required and to achieve a well-defined goal, continuously allow recovery from paralysis and always consider alternative therapies. Now we have a lot of uh, new set of pharmacological options to uh, make the patient tolerate the uh, mechanical ventilation and uh, facilitate weaning also. So we'll quickly go to the reversal of neuromuscular blocking drugs. Um, Dr. Binil, shall we take a few more minutes to find, finish? Sure, sure. Okay, fine. So um, just reminding our uh, uh, Albert Einstein's quote, quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. 
so true isn't it so um who is taking this neo sigmin you can go ahead describing sir dr sarida minu <laughs> oh no fine dr minu uh so this is a drug which we use for reversal of uh, neuromuscular blockade okay. uh, anti cholinesterase uh, it will inhibit the enzyme that is cholinesterase responsible for degradation of acetylcholine thus increasing the availability of uh, acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction okay. um uh, then uh, uh, th this has the property of there is a sealing effect for this drugs and the pharmaco uh, the, the other uh, the other drugs which belong to this group include atrophonim and pyridostigmin the dose of neostigmin used for reversal is usually 0.05 mg uh, per kg then um, uh, to avoid uh, to avoid the muscarinic side effects uh, of this drug neostigmin we usually combine it with anticholinergic drugs like glycopyrrolate or atropin muscarinic side effects include uh, bradycardia uh, salivation myosis increased gastric secretion uh, bronchospasm and all so uh, uh, neostigmin is better combined with uh, glycopyrrolate because uh, the anticholinergic effects of uh, uh, the the, uh, the anticholinergic uh, the, uh, the their effects uh, match that is anticholinergic effect of uh, glycopyrrolate matches with the uh, anticholinesterase action, uh, the action of neostigmin so uh, one fourth of the doses like uh, one, one fourth is usually recommended then Uh, then sir other uh, uh, side effects associated with uh, neo neostigmin reversal is that uh, there can be a paradoxical uh, paradoxical weakness can occur if we are giving this uh, reversal uh, after if if a neuromuscular uh, recovery has fully fully occurred that is stop if stop is more than 0.9 there can occur paradoxical muscle weakness then uh, okay, the mechanical side effects that's a like, very important point when we do something to reverse the neuromuscular blocking and then you end up having a weakness in the patient okay fine so uh, did you notice this color code this is crimson red with white stripes fluorescent red with white stripes so this is the universal color code for uh, reversal of neuromuscular blockage neuromuscular blocker the color code is fluorescent red but for succinylcholine it is uh, the name of the drug is written in a background of black okay coming to just going through the other color codes induction agent yellow benzodiazepine midazolam uh, for uh, orange narcotic morphine so antagonist of narcotic it's uh, blue with white stripes okay same like a vasopressor is violet and uh, violet with white stripes so like in cylinder color code there may be um, uh, variation but i think this is uh, mostly universally accepted color code you can see the anticholinergic agent given in green uh, drug label okay uh, mechanism of reversal of neuromuscular blockage dr minu has already mentioned uh, there is an increase in the presynaptic release of acetylcholine and there is a decrease in enzymatic metabolism of acetylcholine by cholinesterase thereby increasing the receptor binding and competition a decrease in the concentration of uh, neuromuscular blocking drug at the effect site freeing more, more postsynaptic receptors so this is what happens during the regular conduction of across the neuromuscular junction the acetylcholine vesicles get uh, released into the uh, neuromuscular junction it goes and binds to the nicotinic receptors and then when the channels are open the neuromuscular transmission occurs so excess acetylcholine is uh, neutralized by the cholinesterase activity in the cleft so what happens with the neuromuscular blocking drug we can see the trapezium shaped uh, drugs it can either go and bind to the postsynaptic receptors or presynaptic receptors competitively and then it uh, doesn't allow the magic of acetylcholine to continue with the neuromuscular transmission of the signal so this neuromuscular junction gets blocked and how do we reverse it so when reversal is given the cholinesterase is inhibited there will be more of acetylcholine in the vicinity of this battlefield so when this neuromuscular blocking drugs are almost dissociating from the receptors 
the non uh, the competitive antagonism is won over by the physiological mediator called acetylcholine and then the transmission continues the more the drug level in the blood reduces the more chance of these dissociated molecules getting dis uh, dissociating from the uh, nicotinic receptors and then facilitating neuromuscular transmission so uh, one thing uh, i'm happy that uh, dr menu highlighted it the dose of reversal agent unless and until we know something we cannot quantitate that is the basic principle universally okay so if you are not monitoring quantitatively the depth of neuromuscular blockade basically you don't know how far the reversal agent is required if you are monitoring by a train of four if there are no response in train of four you will not attempt reversal of the neuromuscular residual neuromuscular blocking and maybe after the second twitch has appeared probably you can uh, continue with the um, neosigmin dose of course with the combination of uh, anti uh, anticholinergic drug like uh, atropine or glycopyrrolate so if the top count is 2 to 4 you may require 50 to 70 microgram per kilogram okay but if top count is 4 that means uh, all the four twitches are present plus minus visible visual fade then you might not require the full calculated dose of uh, neosigmin for reversal of neuromuscular blockade unfortunately when we land up in this situation and end up giving the full dose of uh, reversal you might get the flabbiness or uh, muscle weakness um, and inadequate uh, breathing efforts of course and tof ratio is more than or equal to 0.9 reversal is totally not required so unless we monitor the neuromuscular junction or block degree of neuromuscular blockade you don't know where which ground you are playing and you might uh, get deceived by the unknown factor on the left hand side of the monitored value of course if top count is less than 2 post apnea count more than 2 or less than 2 there is no point you continue ventilating and delay reversal which is going to give the best result during profound and deep block neosigmin in any dose will be ineffective and should not be administered during minimal block only sl- small doses are required and a full reversal dose may in fact result in transient neuromuscular weakness that is one point i would like to stress uh, dr charida can you mention on uh, post operative recolorization what causes it or is it actually there i'm not sure sir okay then dr minu post operative recolorization especially um, this is mentioned when the effects of neuromuscular blocking drug persist longer than that of the reversal agent resulting in worsening of residual para- paresis so that was the concept management of reversal in patients with an impaired renal function so uh, this was the logic explained because sometimes the delay in the metabolism and elimination of the relaxant may be further limited in uh, uh, renal impaired renal function probably the residual neuromuscular blockade might outlast the reversal agent but if you look at the actual pharmacological indices renal excretion accounts for 50 to 75% of the plasma clearance of neosigmin pyridoxine and edrophonium in a nephric patients renal kidney uh, patients in end stage renal failure or a nephric patients elimination half life of all three anticholinesterases is prolonged total plasma clearance of these agencies decrease that means even the reversal agent duration is prolonged similar changes in pharmacokinetic characteristics of non depolarizing relaxants um, blockers have been noted in patients with renal failure so the message is post operative residual neuromuscular blockade in patients with renal failure is more likely secondary to improper titration of neuromuscular blocking drugs intraoperatively rather than to inappropriate dosing of anticholinesterase agents okay these are the factors contributing to post operative residual paralysis age especially elderly age group sex 
females more than males organ dysfunction like renal hepatic cardiac neuromuscular uh, disorders drugs like carcinogenic blockers example verapamil magnesium lithium antibiotics like aminoglycosides local anesthetics concurrent administration of volatile agents opioids benzodiazepines and uh, the dose and number of increments the total dose of neuromuscular blocking agent uh, given whether it is given in repeated boluses or infusions the uh, whether the degree of block at the time of administration of reversal agent is known and uh, if there is any background acidosis be it metabolic or respiratory there is electrolyte imbalance hypothermia which is a an avoidable uh, risk factor and lack of neuromuscular monitoring all these can lead on to post operative okay. residual paralysis okay adverse effects of uh, adverse physiological effects of neostigmine in the setting of complete neuromuscular recovery it can cause sensitivity of the upper airway muscles to an over abundance of acetylcholine with uh, three mechanisms desensitization of acetylcholine receptor depolarizing blockade or an open channel blockade okay so uh, quick questions only as anticholinesterase that can cross blood brain barrier is can somebody mm -hmm. volunteer okay. it's isostigmine so it is used to reverse the central anticholinergic syndrome which is a non risk factor for post operative cognitive dysfunction the only anticholinesterase available as oral preparation peridone syndrome peridone syndrome so that's why it's used for uh, myasthenia gravis mm -hmm. patient requires long term uh, anticholinesterase administration short acting anticholinesterase edrophonium the last one edrophonium that's why it's used in tensilon test okay. to differentiate between myasthenic crisis and cholinergic mm -hmm. crisis so um, who is describing sugamadex very quickly uh, me sir yes please uh, so the madex is a uh, gamma cyclodex modified gamma cyclodextrin it yes. uh, mechanism of action uh, is by a selective relaxant binding by encapsulating principle and this okay. is used for the reversal of steroidal uh, non depolarizing drugs and okay. it has a shape of a truncated corner uh, donut and it has a hydrophilic interior and a hydrophobic hydrophobic interior and a hydrophilic exterior and it binds to the steroid compound in a 1 is to 1 ratio and it okay. can eliminate uh, the drug as a complex the more, uh, uh, in case of affinity it has more affinity for rocuronium and then to uh, vecuronium and it is has a lesser affinity to pancuronium okay. uh, the major advantage is that it can uh, the mechanism of action is mainly by uh, forming complexes and once complexes is formed in the plasma there is a concentration gradient uh, with that of the neuromuscular junction so the neuro uh, rocuronium from the neuromuscular junction flows into the plasma so that the plasma concentration of rocuronium increases and it is then finally uh, further encapsulated and results in the excretion so uh, in case of uh, 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 giving sugamadex the plasma concentration of rocuronium is increased and it is encapsulated and excreted the excretion of plasma uh, uh, there is no active uh, protein binding to the sugamadex and it is excreted unchanged in urine Uh, the rocuronium is actually uh, by biliary excretion but the as the complex is so big it is it cannot be excreted by the biliary form and the dose of uh, sugamadex is actually 0.8 to uh, uh, 0.1 to 8 mg per kg is said that optimal dose is 4 mg per kg and the major advantage is that it can be given in profound uh, neuromuscular blockade if given in a very large dose of 16 mg per kg even after administration of rocuronium uh 3 minutes ago and uh, the reversal can be attained by a mean duration of 2.9 uh, minutes okay actually uh, that is something that can revolutionize our uh, difficult airway algorithm once uh, this drug becomes available for use or maybe um, there will be a place for a sugamadex when it is uh, widely available and accepted okay because sometimes the giving relaxant might change the airway scenario all of a sudden and might be a solution to our difficult airway puzzle but right now since we don't have a rapid uh, reversal option especially when you are committed with a high dose for rapid securing of airway uh, right now without sugamadex we need to follow the currently accepted difficult airway um, algorithm uh, from audience you can text the name of the new agent to reverse the effects of benzyl isoquinoline and steroidal neuromuscular blocking agents because sugamadex will take care of only uh, uh, 
Tickling your memory or uh, searching Google? Yes, yes. The answer is coming. Calabardion. Yes. Okay. Fine. It's a new agent to reverse the effects of benzyl isoquinoline and steroidal neuromuscular blocking agents. And um, I think I would suggest you to read the current status of neuromuscular reversal and monitoring the article in anesthesiology journal for completion. Okay, I think uh, that's it, uh, what I have prepared for uh, today. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Charida and Dr. Menu yes, and you, Dr. Paul. I think um, I tried to go through the neuromuscular blocking drug. I uh, intentionally prepared uh, questions for the audience so that uh, they will also have a say in our discussion and uh, I put slides so that uh, those who are watching in the YouTube can quickly refer back and uh, see the answers as well. Over to you, Dr. Paul. Thank you, Dr. Sanisha. I'm sure uh, like uh, the each and every candidate who the PGs who had attended, uh, they got the information how to present and how to move about in, in the Viva Vosa. It was uh, really interesting and uh, informative, Sanish. And also to both uh, our uh, PGs, they have tried their best. Uh, to accommodate your questions and uh, mostly uh, the answers also. Yeah, and uh, actually, I um, what I left out is something, some questions related to uh, detubercurinin and galamine, but some examiners might uh, choose you on these yeah, also, yeah. especially when you are discussing the properties of the neuromuscular blockers. Over to you, Binil. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanish and Dr. Paul, for the wonderful session. And uh, before we get, I have uh, uh, the, the participants. You are not audible, Binil. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paul and Dr. Sanish, for the wonderful session. And uh, now the participants can unmute and ask the questions if they yeah, if they if, uh, if they want. And even the uh, Vatasar is there. You can ask the Vatessa also uh, regarding the first topic. And uh, before moving on to the questions and, and answering session, I would like to uh, share the topic for the next week. Next week, there will be, uh, on Saturday, 6 p.m., there will be two topics. The first one will be Modes of Ventilation Part 2 by uh, Dr. J.B. Divadia. Divadia will be presenting the second part of today's uh, topic, that Modes of Ventilation. And the second topic will be Obstructive Jaundice by Dr. Shaji K.R. from Professor from Government Medical College, Trishur, and Dr. Nisha Rajmohan, uh, Senior Consultant from Astor Med City Coach. So I request all the um, PG students to join for uh, next week's session. And uh, those who are interested to join PG Update WhatsApp group, they can send a message to 903 mention your name and college. Now, if uh, some of the participants, if they are having any questions, uh, they can directly unmute and ask our faculties. Giri, sir, please. Please unmute and ask, sir. In the icon, I am the icon. <laughs> Share your experience. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, topic today. Even drug also, there are a lot of things to learn uh, from the this thing. Debate is un, unparalleled because the basics, uh, anybody who doesn't know anything about can uh, know about uh, ventilation and uh, ventilators with that uh, such a basic, uh, even uh, which I forgot and all, I started uh, thinking. I had one doubt which I will not ask her, I will ask the only separately. Uh, that thing and the drugs also really wonderful because uh, uh, rethinking all what we have learned long back and all you people who are in medical college are reading daily daily we are not reading that much uh, really good uh, experience and uh, not only BGs we also will get to refresh our knowledge and uh, new drugs and all this is a curium, curium and all uh, new things what are coming advantage we will be doing that with the new things anyway uh, well done uh, 
both faculties and uh, pg they have also prepared well and they were doing very fast uh, is it required in the exam this fast or uh, is it for this purpose i, I just wanted to due, due, due to my curiosity i am asking is there time limit to explain these things or because it is very difficult for us to grasp when they do so fast that's the reason i am telling not other reason if you give the answer very fast means then people old people like me will take some time to <laughs> grasp that that is why is it really required or it is that is the thing Sir, sir, actually, uh, one of the skill in presenting the um, viva station is to gauge the examiner also. If you are okay. uh, speaking very fast and you should get that message from the examiner's body language, then you change your pace. Okay. So most examiners won't like uh, speaking at uh, fifth gear right from the beginning. But um, for this webinar purpose, it's okay. Thing. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but uh, and um, uh, real life exam, we may not, we may not get a continuous uh, free flow talking time for uh, three minutes. You will be interrupted in between. Okay, All right. Thank you, thank you. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, Sunny sir, a few questions are there in the chat box. If you want, you can address that. Sunny was in Kasaragod a long back, uh, taking class in Kasaragod. He may be remembering when uh, yeah. we were doing that in Kasaragod. He took class in. Uh, Kasaragod yes, also with the Madhusudan. He yes, came yes, to Kasaragod. Yes, <laughs> Very much. Sir, a few questions. A couple of questions are there in the chat box. Somebody asked about uh, uh, Atracurium uh, needs to be given over 60 seconds. That That is one question. No, actually, I think the faster you give, more chance of getting histamine release. I don't uh, have a reference to indicate whether the 20 seconds or 30 seconds, but it's always better to give it um, as a slow bolus because of the risk of um, system and release. Second, somebody asked me, uh, do we use reversal when atracurium, cisatracurium is used? Depends on the scenario. Actually, when I was doing my post-graduation, I asked my faculty uh, because many people were telling me that when you use atracurium, you give half the reversal. So he straight away asked me, have you read this in any of the textbooks? I said, no. In that case, we will follow what is uh, the standard protocol. So basically, it's about uh, monitoring the neuromuscular blockade and then giving the dose accordingly. If you monitor the neuromuscular junction um, um, uh, depth and if the TOF ratio is more than 0.9, no question of reversal at all. It have, it's the same principle but you are more likely to get a higher TOF ratio when you are using cis atracurium and you are timing it um, according to its properties. Okay. Many people, what they do is whether they use vecuronium, rocuronium or atracurium, they give in the air regular time intervals every 20 minutes or every 30 minutes like that. Especially when we are not always using the neuromuscular monitor. So I think that that answers it. But technically, yes. you should give reversal when there is a um, residual neuromuscular blockade, and that is a culprit for postoperative pulmonary complications and other issues related to inadequate reversal. So that needs to be addressed. Uh, I have one question. It is not in this subject. Eh? See, regarding giving the neuromuscular repeat doses, eh? when we don't have this uh, neuromuscular yeah. one, like. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any uh, TOF or so, you said uh, in the time interval 15. Wow, what should be the standard? Is that time interval or patient start backing or seeing the ETCO to grab that patient attempt? How that? Uh, what no, is the sir, best? When you sir, don't have basi um, Basically, then we have to look at the what is called surrogate indicators. Then again, it depends on which surgery you are addressing, whether it is a laparotomy, thoracotomy, where we need uh, more depth, or if it is a superficial surgery then you can wait till probably uh, you get a uh, change in the ETCO2 curve. But if it is a um, neurosurgery, you can't afford to wait till the ETCO2 curve comes. Then you have to go empirically and then go titrating after the main surgical part is over. That's the only part when we can uh, tend to relax a bit on the depth of neuromuscular blockade. Of course, the other agents, uh, the volatile agents you are using, the opioid you are using, everything will contribute to the tolerating ET2 purpose. So in that case, if you don't monitor the neuromuscular junction, you have to depend on other indicators or other monitors 
depending on what surgery, what phase of surgery like that. Probably neurosurgery and all initially, we give, uh, probably we tend to err on the overdosing side because um, it's always better to wait for a recovery for a few minutes or half an hour rather than having the taking the risk of patient bucking in between a neurosurgery. So like that. Sir, any comment on decamethonium? I have no... Um, I asked decamethonium for research purpose. Yeah. That is <laughs> so I don't have a ready-made answers with me right now. Sorry. Sir, one question, please. Can I ask? Yeah, please. Please ask. Uh, sir, sir, if we don't have neuromuscular junction monitoring, we should always use the full dose of reversal agents. Yeah, that is one thing. But then um, you need to keep that possibility in mind. Okay. So that, that's all we can say. Because then, uh, say, depending on the case, you can plan your depth of anesthesia, uh, depth of uh, neuromuscular blocker. See, surgical block is if you have a neuromuscular monitor, two to three teachers. So if it's an ophthal surgery, zero. So your uh, depth target changes. So depending on how much dose, accumulative dose uh, you have given and when was the last dose, you probably time it. And um, probably clinically, if you are looking at uh, timing of reversal, at least wait for uh, uh, spontaneous breathing attempts and then start reversing. And um, I think it's a good practice to give reversal over a period of minutes rather than giving it like a bolus. Many people calculate for 50 max per kg uh, mixed with, with, um, mix with atropine or glycoperlate depending on your practice. And when somebody says it's time to reverse, they give over 10 seconds, which may not be a good practice. You can give small boluses because whatever you give, your peak onset is attained only after five to seven minutes. So you need to wait anyways. So you give, uh, smaller aliquots of uh, reversal agent and then titrate to see your, you can give the full dose, but then you titrate to see the uh, effect, what you said. Yes. Sir, uh, after how many minutes we'll give the next uh, titrated dose? No, like um, uh, practically what we do is maybe if you, your total dose comes to around 7 ml, you give 2 ml, wait for a few minutes and see if the um, tidal volume and the breathing pattern picks up, then give next two ml like that you give. Every three so minutes or five no, minutes. It's, it's an empirical decision. There is no hard and fast rule. Anyway, you said they, you are blinded with regard to the depth of anesthesia. So you won't get a, a clear cut uh, recommendation regarding how to administer that. Basically anesthesia is a skill and a science. So and so for uh, atracurium, we are using reversal always. We are giving reversal in Yes, yes. yeah. Said. Yeah, depending on the depth of block, like uh, if you give an uh, intubating dose of atracurium if surgery gets over in 15 minutes, you have to keep on ventilating for another 15, 20 minutes again and see, because there are lots of factors interfering with it. It's background um, metabolism, uh, temperature, age factor, and the requirement factor. And if you monitor neuromuscular junction, you find that not always you are 0.5 milligram per kg works especially if the patient is on an enzyme induction agent like eptoin or um, um, other enzyme, hepatic enzyme inducers, your drug may not be adequate. That, that is the point in advocating for neuromuscular monitoring, especially when you are doing neurosurgery cases where the patients are very likely to be on phenobarbitone, um, eptoin and all, then uh, you, you don't get an adequate uh, intubating conditions then you are likely to cause raised ICP and other related issues. So those cases, you have to either err on the side of an additional extra dose of uh, intubating dose. So there are no universal dose. Each patient differs. Um, that's how it goes. Like um, you look at the patient, background condition and medications he's on. If you intubate an acidotic patient, your drug may not be working. Because again, there will be a prolonged neuromuscular blockade, patient with hypomagnesemia, patient getting aminoglycosides, all these factors will interfere. So you can't have a one size fits for all package for a event reversal or giving neuromuscular blockers. Okay, so thanks. Okay, welcome. You have explained very well regularization and regularization, but repeatedly our participants. 
hello sir asking to explain again one at least uh, regarding what hello i didn't hear in between you see the chat box it's clear yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, repolarization and depolarization they are asking again okay okay Pre-correlization, basically for uh, avoiding just see the question yeah, yeah. okay so uh, pre basically it's a kind of um, um, administering and 20% dose of ed95 that is 10% of the intubating dose prior um, to administration of uh, succinyl choline so uh, idea is to avoid a fasciculation raised intraocular pressure those kind of things that uh, side effects we get due to increased uh, fasciculation but the disadvantage is you tend to require higher dose of um, succinyl choline that is the disadvantage then uh, recurrization i explained like an um, systemic derangement liver dysfunction renal dysfunction the uh, duration of action of reversal agents or neostipmin is also prolonged probably equivalent to the prolongation of uh, uh, duration of the neuromuscular blockers so in case you get uh, something like residual neuromuscular blockade in those cases you have to work on other background conditions rather than thinking about recurrization because other conditions like uh, persistent acidosis hypothermia all these factors or uh, concurrent use of antibiotics that may be the reason for post operative uh, neuromuscular residual neuromuscular blockade because if you go through the classification it's not these set of drugs which can cause relaxation because even our volatile agents like halothane sulforane they can also cause neuromuscular um, relaxation that is why in myasthenia gravis we are able to do the case without proper neuromuscular blocking drugs we can facilitate endotracheal intubation with the volatile induction or an additional dose of propofol and uh, methods like that to facilitate intubation and tolerating mechanical ventilation and even facilitating the surgery with a reasonably good uh, neuromuscular blockade comment on doing lfts on colon maintenance as a relaxant um basically i have no uh, personal exposure to um a situation where the surgeon is so fast that we can uh, get a cesarean section done with um, repeat doses of succinyl choline i know some of the institutions it may be done but um, there is a risk of uh, continuous infusion giving rise to phase 2 block that is the risk but uh, what we generally do is uh, we give as second agent like atracurium or cisatracurium to facilitate the rest of the part yes definitely the lack of or reduction in the pseudocholinesterase is a concern in pregnancy so it's uh, better to document recovery from succinyl choline before administering the next one again then word of caution if you are a, if you are going to document the recovery from succinyl choline by waiting for the patient to buck then uh, your next dose again will take another 2 and a half to 3 minutes to give adequate neuromuscular blockade and that will be the period when the surgeon will require maximum uh, relaxation so that is a difficult uh, scenario to tackle so if you have a neuromuscular monitor yes otherwise at the earliest sign of uh, uh, recovery from succinyl choline you can administer the next dose of intermediate dose Uh, is there a maximum dose of reversal that can be given regardless of the weight of the patient? Uh, uh, personally, I am not aware of it. The textbook mentioned 50 to 70 mics, and some books mention 80 mics per kg is the, the recommended maximum dose of reversal. Uh, regardless of the weight of the patient, I have no idea. The maximum dose of scolin uh, uh, just uh, the 300 mg. earlier when we were teaching it was told that the 300 mg scolin is the maximum dose you can give okay if it goes more than the first block is there any role for reversal if it is first block yeah actually some cases you, you can manage uh, your reversal is going to be uh, beneficial in reducing the or uh, to fasten to the extubation criteria but uh, most of the time 
it's better to ventilate till patient comes out of uh, phase 2 blockade depends on your institution I mean, tube apnea in that case how will we know that tube apnea they say that once you remove the tube patient will uh, freeze because it was told when you are studying tube apnea and it uh, happens even recently also i had a case that uh, not breathing once i removed the tube i tried that because this time is over i didn't give much uh, drug also once okay. i removed the tube yes patient started breathing tube apnea mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. I don't know whether it is somewhere, but uh, yeah. that worked well. Yeah. Okay. It was an easy intervention. So I, I thought that, okay, let me try that. And the patient breathed well uh, immediately once I removed the tube. Mm -hmm. yes, I haven't read. <laughs> Maybe then. Children uh, now uh, practiced uh, when we were studying uh, school was contrary to children uh, below two years. Now I uh, recently in CMEs, I am hearing that it can give any children. Uh, uh, is it uh, so? Pre previously, myopathy and all were a concern where you might get abnormal response to succinyl choline and this uh, risk of hyperkalemia, this uh, diacardia, etc. But now in the present scenario, we can't uh, <laughs> Categorize pediatric population as a population where you have to be cautious. That caution applies to all the population. Maybe the risk of myopathy and undiagnosed myopathy may be more in children. But um, generally, there is no hard and fast rule. But the dictum is whenever airway is a concern, it takes priority over all other concerns. Because uh, rather than giving a longer acting relaxation and uh, getting into an unable to ventilate scenario, short acting succinyl choline may be a better bet in most of the situations. So in anesthesia, I think the general dictum is whenever airway securing is the priority, go ahead with the best option which suits your airway management and manage the remaining complications as it comes. Because if you lose airway, you land up in cannot ventilate, cannot intubate situation, then it, it, it must be catastrophe results. That actually, most of the examiners will choose on these lines definitely when we take uh, succinyl choline. So I think one of I remember one of my seniors uh, suggesting me that uh, you don't include succinyl choline in your first choice because there are lots of questions, lots of areas to be explored in relation to succinyl choline because it's a uh, maybe a time tested. Sex, um, drug and it has uh, various dimensions. So in the beginning, I mentioned uh, you should have a short list of uh, four or five drugs on which you are very strong. But um, if you know all these uh, possible deviations, then yes, you can. There is no more questions. I think we can conclude this session. Anything else, Dr. Sani? Um, I didn't find any more questions. I, I really uh, appreciate uh, both our postgraduate um, delegates for today's session. They have prepared uh, well, maybe better than me. And uh, thank you very much for putting up a nice show. Wish you all the best in your future. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Benil, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Benkdagiri, for this uh, excellent opportunity to, par to be part of, uh, I think, the most favorite uh, PG academic program of this time. Thank you. Congratulations and thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And if the devotee, sir, is there, sir, please uh, comment from you, sir. So, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I think this is an extremely popular and uh, very well conceived program. Uh, I think for the, for the postgraduates, uh, I want to congratulate uh, the entire ISA Kerala branch for conceiving and implementing this program. So I think uh, I have the discussion on the drugs was quite uh, excellent. I think both the students as well as the faculty was very well prepared with all the drugs. And I like Dr. Sanish's initial comment, you know, that uh, you must pick a drug. It should not be or something like it should not be your death sentence or something words to that effect. So I think that's a very important uh, message that should go across to 
all the students and so i think congratulations and i'm really happy to be part of this activity Thank you, sir, for staying till the end. Uh, the busy man staying till end after his talk. We don't see many times uh, anybody staying up there. Talk. Give it to sir. See, for three hours uh, he is with the uh, this team from uh, uh, maybe five fifty. He has logged in and it is uh, now eight fifty. Thank you so much, sir. You are sparing your time and all uh, being with us and uh, full time after your topic also. Thank you. We are eagerly waiting. We are eagerly waiting for the part two of uh, the modes of ventilation uh, for next week. Thank you, sir. For uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. I'll see you next week. Thank you, sir. And uh, so over to uh, Nasser, sir, for concluding remarks and a lot of thanks. Yeah, that was a wonderful occasion for us, uh, especially. A senior member of faculty, well-known faculty like uh, Dr. Diveja with us, uh, as Giri said, uh, for the last Your talk was really special and really useful. Not, uh, not only a postgraduate topic, it's a topic for us also. As Giri said, we could uh, refresh or uh, we could learn a lot of things. Thank you, Dr. Diveja and uh, Dr. Sajis and Dr. Paul for the wonderful interactive session you had. Thank you all. Bindu, you, you are, uh, thanks to us. Uh, we should, we should ex extend our thanks to our PG students, Dr. Chairuta and Dr. Minu Rose. They also performed very well and congratulations to them. Uh, uh, we will be uh, 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 allotting a certificate on, uh, on the next, next uh, Saturday. Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.